Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Resource Safety and Health Queensland's annual Industry Leaders Briefing. We appreciate you making time in your busy schedules to join us this morning, and we welcome stakeholders from across industry, unions, academia, and government. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land upon which we meet and pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. The purpose of today's briefing is to share information and provoke thought. In the most part, this will be a distillation of key of activities recently completed, our findings and recommendations, and advice on focus areas for the coming months. Appreciating that your time is valuable, our agenda is jam-packed so that we can virtually let you go by midday. Along with briefings from my team, we'll hear from our guest speaker, Paul Hillier, from the Australian Road Research Board. Paul's team have done some fantastic work here and overseas, and we're thrilled that they can join with us today and share some of their case study work. While most of today's communication is outward, we also want to hear from you and ask that you send your comments and questions to the email address provided. We commit to providing our response online along with today's presentations. Joining us shortly will be the Minister for Resources to provide his opening remarks and set the scene for this year's briefing. In July last year, the Resources Safety and Health Queensland Act commenced. RSHQ became a statutory body reporting directly to the responsible Minister for Resources. No longer a division within a portfolio department, RSHQ became separate from the resource attraction and development activities of government and with a singular focus on the safety and health of workers and affected communities. You'll see that the components parts of the regulator are unchanged, comprising the inspectorates for coal mining, petroleum and gas, explosives, mineral mines and quarries, the Safety and Mines Testing and Research Station, or CINTARS, our Occupational Health and Hygiene Division, created following the re-identification of dust lung disease, and the corporate function, which supports delivery of our work and has exclusive responsibility for developing and progressing policy and legislation on behalf of the minister. The RSHQ Act also created an independent office of the Commissioner for Resources, Safety and Health, responsible for monitoring and reviewing the performance of RSHQ's functions, advising the Minister for Resources and chairing two statutory mining and quarrying safety and health advisory committees. The two advisory committees maintain a strategic view of the risk to workers. External audit of the performance of RSHQ is undertaken by the Queensland Audit Office, the independent auditor for the public service. Oversight is also provided by the Queensland Ombudsman in the areas of complaint investigation, public interest disclosure and administrative decision making. Finally, also arising from the RSHQ Act is the role of the WHS prosecutor established under the Work Health and Safety Act with exclusive powers to prosecute serious offences under the RSHQ legislation. Matters for consideration by the WHS prosecutor are referred by the Chief Executive of RSHQ following investigation. RSHQ's vision is for a resource sector free from fatality, serious injury, and occupational disease. To achieve this, we deliver against three strategic objectives. First, we are a risk-based regulator with a deliberate focus on serious harm reduction. We prioritize our activities based on risk to workers and to the community. Second, we aspire to be an exemplar expert regulator. Achieving this requires maintenance of a contemporary regulatory framework and regulatory approach. 
one which is focused on outcomes. It's not enough that regulators only deliver annual compliance programs. And while some stakeholders remain focused on the numbers of things we do, i.e. outputs, it is our responsibility, it is my responsibility to demonstrate that it's the outcomes that matter, e.g. serious harm reduction through better risk management. Third, we exist to promote improved safety and health outcomes. And we do this through delivering a range of programs and services, including providing testing, calibration, engineering, scientific and training services, facilitating effective health surveillance and digital records management, supporting industries emergency preparedness and response, sponsoring and undertaking research under the guidance of our independently chaired advisory committee and engaging stakeholders to address the important safety and health challenges ahead of us. We will see many examples of our strategic objectives during today, many of which are being achieved through close collaboration with you, our stakeholders. To get us underway, I'd like to invite the Minister for Resources to provide opening remarks and set the scene for this year's briefing. Scott Stewart MP was returned as the member for Townsville in the 2020 state election and thereafter appointed to the Palaszczuk cabinet. Prior to being elected to parliament in 2015, he spent almost three years, three decades as an educator, serving as a high school principal and teacher. Welcome minister. Thanks very much, Mark, and a great pleasure to be here and uh, great to be amongst you all today. Mark, it did feel like three years, it goes that quickly, but uh, 30 years of working with kids, uh, particularly in high schools, has been a really interesting time of my life. And now I've stepped into politics. Uh, my wife said I've jumped from the, uh, out of the frying pan and now into the fire, but uh, it's great to be with you today and, and great to uh, see that so many of you are actually joining this. Um, can I first acknowledge the traditional owners of the land in which we meet today, and pay my respects to their elders, past, present, of course, uh, those emerging. I'd also like to thank the Chief Executive Officer, uh, Mark Stone, and the RSHQ team for having me here today. We have a couple of people sitting in the room today. Uh, I must admit, this is my very first time that I've done uh, a conference like this where I just look into a camera uh, without getting the responses back from the audience. It can be a little bit, uh, little bit tough, a little bit interesting, but uh, bear with me and, and hopefully I'll keep my, uh, my presentation uh, nice and short for you this morning so you can get on with the real work. Uh, but, um, a little bit about me, I suppose uh, my history in uh, mining goes way back to my great grandfather in his days. And so uh, Walter John Davidson was one of the original uh, miners and workers at Mount Isa Mines back in 1924, so nearly 100 years ago. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, times have changed. Uh, he did a lot of work, particularly in starting the mine, but then did a lot of work around shoring up the uh, the mine sites and uh, the underground uh, mining that was happening with uh, the timber that he used to cut and drag back into the mine. So uh, times have changed. Uh, but what we do see is that um, uh, these things, the, the perceptions, I suppose, are that mining is a hazardous industry and that uh, injuries are just part of the job. Uh, that's now unacceptable. We need to make those changes happening. And uh, what we need to see is a real commitment from our minds. We're, we're moving through that with them, but also the work of RSHQ to actually make sure that our minds are doing everything they can to make sure that the best thing that comes out of our minds each and every day at the end of the shift are our workers. They're the most important things. We want them to go back to their families, back to their friends, enjoy their time, but making sure that they're safe in everything that they do. Um, can I take this opportunity to thank you for all the work that you did, particularly during COVID-19? Uh, we have around 68,000 workers involved in the resource industry. Um, I can tell you that not one single case of COVID-19 was recorded back through the resource industry. And I think that really shows a real commitment that the, uh, the industry and um, all our, our companies and businesses had particularly to making sure that they kept their workers safe. But I also think it extended beyond just the gates of the work site. So not only was it about keeping their workers safe, but it was also about keeping the communities that our, our miners live and work in, keeping them safe as well. Because you, if you can imagine in some of our locations, 
particularly where we have uh, in um, some of our uh, indigenous communities. If you can imagine if COVID-19 actually occurred in those communities, some of those most at-risk groups within our society, if there was one case in those communities, it would have spread like wildfire. So the seriousness and, and the, the way that people approach that risk, uh, hats off to you. You did an outstanding job and thank you for all the work that you did to make sure that our miners turned up each and every day and that they were safe and that all the checks and balances were put in place. 68,000 workers, not one single case. I think that's that's got to be some sort of record. And I think we should be very proud of that, proud of the work that each and every one of you did. Uh, look, over, I suppose, the um, uh, my, my predecessor, uh, that a lot of you met, Dr. Anthony Lynham, uh, two reports were commissioned. And from that, we had probably some of the most extensive amount of uh, mine safety legislation and processes introduced. We now have some of the toughest uh, uh, safety laws anywhere, not only in our country, but right across the globe. And I think that's a real commitment that we see from industry and from government working together to make sure that safety is got to be the number one key priority in what we do. Uh, as I said in my introduction, um, you know, there's a perception that it's a hazardous industry and that, that uh, in, uh, in, in, sorry, that uh, <laughs> injuries are just part of the job. Well, that's not acceptable. And we are doing those steps and we're backing that up with legislation. And some of that legislation hadn't been changed for 20 years. So it was quite progressive in that, uh, that space. And it's great to be able to follow on from that work. What I will mention is that uh, one of the initiatives that uh, Dr. Lynham introduced was in fact the uh, safety reset. Uh, we have been talking to industry about this. We would like to see this continue to make sure that it wasn't just a one-off, that it wasn't just a tokenistic approach to safety, that um, uh, just another hoop for our industry to jump through. We're serious about our safety. Uh, this is reflected back through the conversations we've actually been having with a lot of our industry members. They are very keen to do something as well. Uh, so what's this space? We'll be looking at uh, the mine safety reset on a regular basis and uh, locking it into a particular time frame so that we know that industry can actually plan around that but make sure that each and every one of their workers go through that particular program and that safety is the key component here. I think that's really reflective of the changes that we are making as a government and uh, really a, a real commitment, I suppose, from both government and industry to make sure that uh, we look after our workers each and every day. Uh, so what I want to see basically uh, from this is a change of culture. We need to see that cultural shift where um, mine operators are confident and uh, rest assured that they can report any of their instances, knowing that it will be um, thoroughly examined, that it will be looked at in depth, but making sure that that culture exists where reporting doesn't become something that they want to hide or, or be fearful of, that reporting is part of the culture because they know that when they report something, the outcome is leading to better outcomes, better safety for their workers. That's the culture that we need to move towards. I know that the work from RSHQ is around that, and I applaud you for the work that you do in that space. Uh, cultural shift doesn't happen overnight, uh, but it does happen through lots of working together. And I'm sure that's what I'm hearing from the industry, whether, whether it's the, the safety resets, whether it's the legislative changes that we've introduced, including industrial manslaughter. Um, all these changes is that part of that shift in the culture, but working together, making sure that we get this right has got to be pivotal to get that cultural shift. Um, Look, it's uh, as I said, it's um, it's my job to just uh, continue on from the work from Dr. Anthony Lyon, the great work that he did, um, all that legislative change, uh, making sure that uh, our injuries are reported and that uh, we can make those shifts of that culture. I uh, thank you again for having me along today, and uh, encourage you to uh, really dig your, uh, dig in deep and get your hands dirty with uh, everything that's going on today, and uh, be really actively involved with this because. You know, mining is going to be the cornerstone of our economic recovery. It will create jobs not only now, but for our kids who sit in our classrooms uh, today learning, uh, they will actually see that there is a real career for them, particularly in some of our smaller communities. So what we have seen over the last couple of decades is that some of our smaller communities are, are going through a, a uh, reduction in their numbers, uh, almost dying out because uh, kids are moving from those small communities back into Brisbane or Townsville or those larger centres. What the mining industry and the resource industry is doing is really focusing back on uh, making sure that we can employ locally, 
but also turbocharge those small towns uh, to make sure that they can continue to exist. And I think that's what Queensland's built on, is about uh, looking after one another, looking after our communities, working together, but making sure uh, that each and every miner that goes to work and each and every quarry worker that goes to work comes out at the end of their shift and uh, they've had a great day at their workplace. Thanks everyone and enjoy your day. Thanks, Mark. Well, thank you, Minister. We appreciate you sharing your thoughtful and clear messages. Um, I apologize for wiping out 27 years of your career as an educator and I stand corrected. Um, that concludes our opening. Um, I hope it's provided good context for the presentations which follow. I'd now like to introduce our guest speaker, Mr. Paul Hillier, technology leader at the Australian Road Research Board. Paul has more than 30 years experience in highway network management, safety and maintenance, with the first decade of his career spent within a large UK highway authority and at the UK's Transport Research Laboratory. Paul joined ARRB in 2005, where he has held senior positions leading incident investigations and strategic reviews. His experience is in road safety engineering and associated risk management, and he's conducted numerous road safety assessments for compliance, including the primary industry operations here in Australia and overseas. The title of Paul's talk is Vehicle Related Incidents, Responding to the Brady Report as HRO. We welcome Paul. A little bit of uh, background you've already heard uh, originally from the UK, but uh, my role uh, currently is to affect safety improvements, so improve safety outcomes for various clients that we have, um, working on a range of road networks. So from public road network right the way through to working with primary industry in a range of, of organisations um, around the country. So Bowen Basin, inland Queensland, Mount Isa, uh, Roma, those sort of areas. But I actually reside in uh, Newcastle, so I'm very uh, conscious of the operations happening in the Hunter Valley and the huge part that that plays. But uh, fortunate to get over to Western Australia, South Australia and Tasmania for the uh, mining there. So um, incident investigation is where it sort of all started to me, but then um, much uh, more gratifying to then look at um, some of the contributing factors to these accidents and look at continued improvement, prevent them from happening, um, no satisfaction investigating the same sort of crashes time after time. So um, I have a bit of a keep it real statement. You're probably wondering why there's a bit of a picture there of my family. That's my keep it real every single day to try and save lives on the road. Unfortunately, we get involved We also with the from the sharp end um, in other countries as well. And you can see me there presenting helmets for a, a school in Vietnam. So some nice things that we, we do to uh, control the sort of loop, if you like, and uh, feed back into uh, what we do. So ARRB, Australian Road Research Board, National Transport Research Centre, we were established around about 60 years ago now. Um, uh, definitely an independent uh, expert on transport knowledge. We were established by the state road agencies of, of Australia. So uh, Department of Transport and Main Roads for Queensland and its, uh, and its kindred bodies around the country. Um, we do research, but we also look at applying that. So applying that to uh, technical uh, issues around head office down in Melbourne. We've got uh, offices around the country. I'm out of our Sydney office, around about 200 uh, staff all up, so experts from fields right the way through from uh, highway materials right the way through to the areas that we work in this network management and also uh, things like uh, road safety outcomes, engineering, setting policy and strategy for a range of bodies. The mining work that we've done has certainly been over the last 20 years, um, it extends right, right the way through the, the industry from coal through the uh, the ores, gas quarrying, um, basically anything above surface. So uh, looking at uh, those, look as you can see there, the portholes going into underground mining. Experience with other countries I mentioned, but also overseas, uh, places like PNG, Americas, we've uh, had our involvement within that. And that's been through government departments, through the regulator. So it's excellent and thank you today for Mr. Stewart, um, CEO Mark Stone, and also uh, Rob Dukic for inviting us to, to speak. Um, 
major blue chip companies, so all the, the players, co corporate headquarters, but also the WNH teams. But where we get uh, perhaps our, uh, our our biggest thrill and the work that we do is very definitely at the sharp end, working at the numerous sites that we can do. And I'll explain a little bit more about that as we go on a little bit more about how that works, how that we can work down from uh, the corporate center, if you like, and right the way through to um, working with the people at the sharp end, which are um, the risks on a day-to-day -day basis. But I think one of the most important things, it's important that during our work is that we sort of gain that trust and, and acceptance. And one of the big things, of course, with that is to listen. Um, whilst we've got big experience on the 60 years on the public road network, um, a lot of obviously your facilities aren't public roads, they're unsealed roads, they're uh, you know, dirt and, and rock and, and all these sorts of things that make up your road networks. They're stylists towards production, um, they're an asset which keep your organisation moving, keep your productivity. So there's slightly different focuses, but of with the un overarching umbrella of safety. So there are, we certainly believe, uh, a number of things that we can bring to the table. Um, some overarching principles which we think stand firm from the public road network. But one of the big things to stress as well is that in our 20 years working with the primary industry, um, we've certainly learned a lot. And there are a number of things which we've taken back to uh, public road networks indeed, um, and things which are sort of universal across. So that's been a, a great part of, uh, of what we do. Incident investigation and reconstruction is one of those areas. So if an incident's occurred, um, what the factors were, what has happened, and as you can see one of, these, uh, one of these at the top. So isolated, trying to work out what's happened and the factors in that. Um, that's been for a range of bodies, for the regulators, for the organisations themselves. Um, and it's very often that people look at that and, and they look and they're focusing on who's at fault. But um, increasingly uh, these days and more and more with uh, the uh, operating that we have, looking towards looking at root causes, looking at what we call blameless investigation. So just looking at what happened with a view to improving things in the long run. Can, what can we improve to make sure that the same incident doesn't happen again? What can we learn to apply to other environments as a proactive uh, measure? So that's a slightly different uh, slant. We get involved in ICAMs around the uh, place for investigations and done a number of those now. But also um, what we get involved with is certainly reviewing networks and doing gap analysis of of, of uh, sites and whole networks and various things that are out there, um, into you know, quarrying uh, people's uh, facilities in oil and gas, um, but also that interface with the public road network as well. We often forget that. So pit to port, last mile, a uh, very important part of the business. How does it interface with, with things like rail networks? And you can see a few pictures from some work in Port Hedland that we've done, um, working in Queensland there, uh, as well with uh, where the interface of the mine uh, with the public road network. So development of policies and standards, yes, an important part of that, but it must also then feed down into what's happening on the, on the sites. So we can put forward some procedures, best practice, if you like, in terms of uh, road design operation and its maintenance, but also feeding on that experience, as we said, of what's happening in the industry. Vehicle specifications, certainly, um, we've done some work on that, working with the various bodies in terms of things like vehicle rollovers, rollover protection, um, what safety features vehicles should have on minimum specifications. And uh, but uh, yeah, won't be touching too much on that today, but certainly an area that we can we can look on on that. Um, and really important, I guess, that with our network management hat on, our asset management hat on, that we look at cost effective ideas for safer roads infrastructure, and that extends also down to the materials themselves. So that effective use of local materials uh, to create that local road network. Um, obviously, it's not uh, possible or not desirable in many cases to bring in lots of uh, bituminous blacktop materials, concrete, et cetera, for the road network. So we're working with what we have, a dynamic road network, which is evolving um, in response to operations that are happening. So, you know, natural that it's uh, part and parcel of our discussion and what we can do. 
But certainly training, capability building with, uh, within our expertise as well is something that we very much enjoy doing and uh, we often get asked to, uh, to take part with. But um, I guess, you know, why, why am I here today? We certainly became aware of the Brady Report and I'd like to sort of congratulate everybody who were involved with that um, and certainly the, uh, the regulator for, and the minister for their initiative to, uh, to undertake that report. Um, 47 fatalities in that period, that 20 year period, as you know. Um, and we certainly became aware, we, we started delving into that and became aware that out of the 47 fatalities, 15 of those were vehicle related incidents or what we call surface transport related incidents. Um, and I guess if you, if you wanted to add in some of the associated things, so people getting caught, stuck by machinery, changing tires, that could actually rise up to 41% of the fatalities uh, underneath the review. And certainly the bulletins that we've seen since from RSSQ showing that it still remains that issue there in the uh, minerals and mining, quarrying, uh, coal mining sort of sector. We also became aware of the podcast series, and that's something that we've been uh, promoting to various people uh, that we know our clients of various people around as an excellent example of how things are moving forwards within the industry a real focus on that and indeed this morning um, even had some emails this morning from some uh, clients in Canada saying how much they're enjoying the series and that it's uh, opening their eyes and giving a focus for some of the things that they're doing so I guess today um, 32% of the fatalities were involving vehicles. So what have we got that we can help you with? But I guess some key questions for people there working within the industry, um, not really uh, dependent upon which sort of uh, material or, or, uh, or operation that you're in, but um, so what about your site? Well, have you reviewed your road network and its provision? Is it just seen as an asset? Um, what are the risks there? How do you go about identifying and mitigating the risks that are there? And I guess you could ask that question, you know, do you think you're doing enough? Are some of the things that I'm going to show here, does it sort of strike a chord? Does it, are there some things there that you think you could benefit from? And then finally, I'll touch upon the high reliability organisations, which were introduced through the, uh, the Brady Report and the podcast series. How would they go about uh, mitigating the risk of some of these surface transport related fatalities or indeed risk accidents that are occurring? So one of the things I think that we um, will say is that the issues are essentially the same with the public network, albeit, of course, in the uh, bigger scale. And I think the uh, picture there on the top left sort of sums it up, really. Um, but also noting that it's a dynamic network out there. It's constantly changing for your demands. The network has different functions. So when we go out on sites, obviously, we become aware of the primary hall roads where there's vehicles operating often at uh, you know, 70, 60, 50 kilometers an hour, going right the way down to joint usage in a workshop area, which is down to probably 10 kilometers an hour. There's a range of diverse users from light vehicles up to loaded haul trucks, water carts, dozers, all these sort of things in operation. And then of course are uh, pedestrians. There's lots of different interfaces, not just at the formal intersections, obviously at uh, you know, go lines, crib areas, all these, uh, the pit face itself, blasting. Um, that interface with uh, the public road network, as I've already mentioned. And we have to cope with the risks associated with what we call aggressivity. So big vehicle meets little vehicle, fast big vehicle meets slow vehicle, um, slow maneuvering vehicle. Um, all of these things we need to think about. And we have some things we can put onto the table, which will help from the public road network. But we also need to be aware of the nuances. As I mentioned, we need to understand what's happening in the, uh, the industry. So certainly the might is right rule is something we need to be very aware of that uh, often on a number of sites, people looking at uh, loaded vehicles having uh, preference or, or priority over uh, other vehicles. Um, the left-hand drive nature sometimes of some vehicles, particularly the haul trucks, uh, give rise sometimes to us having to look at the standards and guidelines that we're very familiar with on the public road network and how do they adjust, how do we uh, look at that. And I'll talk about limited lines of sight in a moment as well. 
with operating conditions, obviously things like dust um, and some of the extreme weather events that we have to cope with. Um, we need to think about those and how that uh, these need to be managed. In our early uh, interface with the industry, um, it sort of became very clear that there is a little bit of a, a balance to be struck there, obviously, between that productivity and what's called safe mobility. And this is indeed even a discussion that we've been having on the public road network itself. Can you have mobility that you want in the level of safety that you're prepared to accept? And often people thinking, well, no, that's really hard to achieve. You've got to have one or other. They're a bit of a trade-off. Well, hopefully some of the things that I can show you will uh, hopefully change your mind on that one and think that we can have mobility safely on networks. Every life matters. Yes, you know, my, my keep it real statement, uh, family will want to go home each and safely at the end of each and every day. Um, and our mantra certainly is that if incidents occur, we, we, we must learn from them. They've got huge learning potential. Um, how quickly, um, how we respond to those, could it be a change in design, could it be a change in operating, or indeed even uh, the priority at an intersection, particularly on a site. All of these sort of things are the issues there. Um, I think, uh, you know, I'll kudos some of the things we've achieved on the public road network. In the 1970s, around about 3,700 people killed on our road networks. We're down around about 1,200 um, our number at 2020, but no complacency there. There's lots of things that uh, we have to do and keep doing, and we'll talk about where that's going uh, in a moment. So there are some things that we can put onto the table. Okay. Wanted to move along to some of the things that we can offer, with some of the things that we can help uh, with and help uh, identify and focus the effort in. Um, we're going to touch upon first one of the uh, emphasis, some of our things that we are doing to drive down the road toll. Um, and then we'll talk about a, a number of issues with specific nature that we can help with. But one of the things that we certainly enjoy doing is that when we go in to work with our clients is that we see that there are a number of good things already in place. And often it's a case of bringing those out. It's often a case of connecting those, collating those together. And then indeed, as I mentioned, you know, sharing some of these with the industry. There are a number of good things um, to do with you know, signage delineation um, and also some quite um, uh, effective measures which we've introduced into the public road network as a result of our work in mining. So we mustn't forget that. There is a lot more going on than perhaps um, people think and we need to give them that confidence to keep working on what they're doing. They're heading in the right direction. Uh, and a number of things that they're all doing already. So we're certainly looking towards a more holistic approach these days with respect to roads. Uh, we adopted what we call the safe system approach, which uh, some uh, just over 10 years ago now, um, set it up as a number of pillars or components. Um, as you can see there, safer people, safer speed, safer vehicles, safer roads is probably a very easy uh, way to remember that. So we look at those, but we look at how they interface with each other as well. As the graphic shows, we don't just look at them in isolation. Um, in the past, we've we've adopted and some of the state road agencies and local government tend to a little bit of a silo approach to uh, where things were going with road safety. But it's on the underlying premise that people make mistakes on road networks and that people are fragile. They only have a very limited tolerance to injuries you know we're, we're amazing amazing bodies amazing in nature but um, we all have our limits um, and that is just simply um, in what we do is the kinetic energy i've shown the kinetic energy equation there but the reason for doing so is obviously it is a um, components of that are the mass uh, and the speed of the vehicle v the velocity of the vehicle and the mass so that gives you an idea of the extremes that uh, we can be working on within the mining industry if you think of a loaded a loaded haul truck so it's that vision zero we're working towards vision fatal uh, zero uh, fatal and serious injuries by 2050 and um, that will be a corner pillar of the National Road Safety Strategy, which is just being revised and will be released very, very shortly, the latest update of that. And that's what people are working towards. It's an aspirational target. We believe we can get there. It drives our activities. 
And through our pillars of the SAFE system, we try and build in redundancy into that system. So we bring in our safeguards and people are aware of the uh, Swiss cheese model and reason, the work of reason there, trying to line up all our mitigation measures and our defences. One of the most important things is establishing a road hierarchy. And in our uh, terms on the public highway, we often refer to some things called movement in place or safe mobility, as you've already heard. And what that is all about in a nutshell is really is that the roads have their characteristics, they have their, uh, their nature, um, and that the provision and the infrastructure provision for them um, should be commensurate with their usage. So you establish a hierarchy, as you can see there, here's an example there, road class A through to E, um, from the primary hall roads right the way down to the shared zones. And we do our study, we look at the dominant vehicle types, we describe those roads. And from that, we can then hang things like speed management, speed control, um, the signage that's used, the delineation, the wayfinding, all of the things which create our road network, we can hang from those. So is the road, when people are driving along it, is it actually telling us, is it self-informing um, what we need to do? What do the people need to do when they're riding on that road safely? What actions do they need to take? How do they need to interface with other road users. One of the things we often get asked to do is can we come up with plans, menus and guidance, which also gives some standard designs. And the answer is yes, very definitely. Um, working on that over a number of years. And you know, there's a number of sources that already, a lot of good work being done on this particular areas by the industry and also uh, academia and research bodies as well. So we cover what we call our mid-block sections. So basically the road sections between intersections. We look at ROM, um, go lines, cribs, workshop stalls, refueling areas, all these things which we have on our road network. And then we relate to our road infrastructure elements. What things do we have on there? How are we gonna control traffic? How are we gonna manage our traffic? And what are we gonna to use to do that? So things like standard profiles, as you can see there, um, and the bottom of this particular slide, you can see how we use that road hierarchy, as I mentioned, to hang a speed management regime on our network. So how that's really important that we then um, operate according to the road hierarchy. Here's a few examples on the left-hand side there, sending out some standard drainage profiles to avoid what we've got on the bottom left there, an impassable bogged Hall Road, um, some of, as I mentioned, some often difficult conditions, but um, looking at the best practice or what we can do to help with drainage. Um, what about our intersections? Where is good practice? Taking this from the public road, you know, do we have cross intersections? Do we have T intersections? Um, what's the best practice with that regarding safety? Whether we have intersections on crests, on downhill sections? And we try and um, understand, as you can see on the bottom middle there, the number of conflicts which each part of the road environment gives us and how can we remove some of those. Often it is through things like segregating our larger and our large vehicles, um, controlling access, um, having you know uh, access limitations on certain areas. So we can do that. I mentioned earlier about uh, the vision that we have. Obviously that's crucial to safety, seeing other people see and be seen. Um, top right there, you can see the restrictions on vision on a, on a typical uh, uh, haul truck. And that will also help um, people plan and understand their intersections. And further examples as I go through about some of the standard things that we can help people with. So top left blasting, um, we can have uh, ROM areas there, top right, go lines and cribs. We can help set those out so that we minimize the risks between the road user groups, a nice and logical um, controlled environment that we can help with um, to manage this interaction between many different types. And perhaps the picture in the bottom there summarize, sums that up quite well. You know, we obviously got uh, uh, tire loaders, the haul truck, we've got the, uh, a forklift truck operating around the workshop area there and pedestrians, admin areas, car parks, all these things that we need to, to manage. As we said, people are very, um, uh, are very susceptible to impacts with vehicles due to that kinetic energy, due to our nature, um, and we need to do all we can to manage that, often by reducing speed, but controlling the pathways. 
segregating and separating uh, road user groups. So we can have some standard layouts. This one is, um, these were developed for South Americans. So the signs, um, you know, very definitely can say, look, they are from the South American uh, layouts. Um, but what it's showing you here is the use of uh, windrows and earth buns, the use of uh, signs to control the traffic. Top uh, left is what we call a staggered T intersection. Now, often that's needed to avoid some of the conflicts that we get from cross intersections. Cross intersections can be quite difficult to, to manage and segregate flows. And there have we have here is what we call Y intersection. Um, the uh, standard rules that we operate on the public road network is that the 70 to 90 degree impact, uh, sorry, 70 to 90 degree angle of the minor leg going into the main road is something that we look at. And when we audit sites, we look at those. That gives you your visibility at the intersection, that gives you your swept paths that you need for various vehicles. So we can establish these standard layouts. Um, and initially we had a bit of resistance, people were sort of challenging, you know, oh, it's a bit too, a bit too controlled, we're operating a site here, you know, we're, we're looking to production. Um, and, and indeed, we're often challenged, you know, it just can't be done. Well, can I say, yes, it can be. Um, and here's a, a project here, there's a, a site where it has been put into place using full truck tyres, which are no longer in operation, um, whirly birds for delineation, uh, use of earth windrows, etc. And this is uh, an example that we show around the world, and you'll be pleased to know this is from a site in Queensland. So the things are out there. Um, the network there is inspected regularly, it's maintained well, and that also, yes, gives the people that confidence. It creates that open environment. Will somebody driving on that road know exactly what's expected of them, and will there be the segregation between the vehicle types? So how we manage and identify and mitigate our risks, well, we're all operating within that risk assessment, risk environment. Um, and what we've done is we've built on the hierarchy of controls that people are very familiar with under their normal WHS work. And we've applied it to uh, the road network and the risks that we have there. So working down from elimination, obviously that's separating and segregating flows. So, you know, do we have a whole road that we just prohibit light vehicles. There are no light vehicles on that particular haul road, um, right the way down to our software controls. Now, um, a lot of the engineering, a lot of the stuff that we were put forward puts in the engineering. Um, and as with all things, we try and move away from some of the uh, administrative controls. And I think that's something that come, comes out of the, uh, the Brady Report and also the podcast very definitely is the um, moving away from reliance upon the softer um, admin side controls, going into hard controls and things that we can do. Um, but also some very effective low cost measures. So as you can see on the right hand side of that picture there, um, delineators with reflectors and various things can be um, you know, quite a, a cost effective way uh, of helping people around the site using the windrows in association with those. Okay, yes, they need to be maintained. That's a really important point but they can be there um, to guide people around the network. Maintain, yes, um, a lot of the work we do, obviously in auditing, we're picking up some fairly routine sort of hazards. We don't have to uh, work too hard to spot these and put them in, but they are very significant, they are very important. We can certainly uh, identify a number of incidents and crashes that occur due to things like faded sign faces, signs obscured by vegetation, um, and certainly with signage, non-standard signs. So the importance of Australian Standard 1742, using the signs, but then understanding that we need to be flexible. We need to think about obviously mounting heights for some of the larger vehicles, uh, very different vehicles than we get on our public road network, um, where the signs are located, how do we make them portable to move them around the site to react to dynamic uh, changes to the road network, you know, the road which we might need open now, um, which then might get closed down for the next couple of months, but we still need to react to that and have controls when it is open and operating. So the condition of the road surface, the drainage, as you can see, bottom middle, but also uh, the situations that we get, obviously, with dust. Um, in some mine environments, obviously, is something that we need to, to cope with. So maintenance, you know, the water cart frequencies, how things are uh, our water to maintain the greater operations, all these things we, 
we look at to help. So I thought I'd just round things off with just a little bit of a case study where we've actually um, started off going in and working with an organization. This happens to be an overseas one, but it tells the story uh, of a number of bodies that we've worked with. Um, we started off with uh, an engagement through their corporate uh, head, their corporate hub, um, to investigate some crashes. And these were pretty much done as a death study. We were provided with uh, local information and we were asked to look at the contributing factors. So to their credit, they were moving away a little bit of, of that fault, although there was still uh, quite a focus on driver error and driver inattention, et cetera, as being a huge component of this particular cases we were looking at. Well, we started stripping that back. We critiqued the local investigation, how they preserve the, uh, the physical evidence on there to reconstruct it. We started talking about things like capturing the data from the vehicle black boxes, the reconstruction of that, looking at the physical evidence, basically looking at what happened, why it occurred, and what we could learn from that. So good work there. That then led to some improvements in their protocols indeed. And, and this was uh, an organization that has uh, two or three sections. They, they mine different commodities. Um, and a number of different sites under each one of those commodities as well. So they then said, okay, what are the lessons you learned from this investigation? And we can apply those to individual site, but we can also help with things like prompts and checklists to help people with investigating their crashes. Also with training in the area of investigation as well. I mean, obviously um, it's, it's a, 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 a cost and it's expense obviously are involving us to investigate a crash. So. Um, having that capability in-house and having the confidence that it uh, can do the job, um, very, very important. So training people on that is, is a really important part of the work that we do. So looking at that, that's where it sort of all started. Then it grew the interest, came in about uh, auditing some sites for them. So we had uh, a couple of people go out and look at their sites. Um, and conducting network level safety audits. So we drive around the sites under a number of uh, a number of days, understand what the uh, operation is, what are the key areas and functions uh, within there, what are the vehicle types, what are the interactions, et cetera. And we start building up the identification and rating of risks across that network. We can then work on uh, mitigation measures. And one of the great things you can see on the top of the picture here is a, a bit of an environment where there are lots of different interactions. There's a Hall road, there's a, a major uh, hall road for, for loaded haul vehicles, there's a light vehicle intersection, there is a um, park up area for some of the vehicles, they do hot changes at this particular mine, um, there is a, um, a refueling area and a bit of a workshop area as well. So we had to work with them to come up with some ideas and what we actually did was we decided to conduct, as we here do here in virtual electronic form, um, a meeting. And we had put up the various different pictures, the aerial views, the various information that we knew. And we started sketching on them, as you can see on the bottom right there. And you know, a few other things we rubbed out, we started again, we got some information as to um, why this uh, might not be the case or might not work. And then by the end of the session, the actual, the local teams were proposing um, things to us and it was very clear that through working with us and discussing things and, and getting the concepts and the principles you come up with some really really good ideas it was a bit of a light bulb moment and it came up with some of those practical uh, outcomes that we were looking for so from a sketch plan obviously then now they can look up and, and work up their designs for their site um, implement it and hopefully come up with some some good outcomes so it really was through working with them the suspicion uh, broke away um, and we became what we were all, all together keen on being at the further, that sort of trusted advisor type role. Um, really important. It's not, you know, do as we say, it's really working with them to create a safer environment that works in with their, uh, with their network. For the corporate team, they also wanted us to develop some traffic management plans uh, and a road design plan to set those standard profiles, those standard guidelines. And yes, we did that. We worked with them on a scope, a contents page, um, and that sort of sets the organizational standards. But um, 
what was very, very important is that the corporate had then said, right, we need to implement this across the board, but these are the established principles, but the operation of that and the implementation of that will be done through the commodities, through the individual sites. So again, this sort of local implementation, the practical experience coming into play, the local response to these traffic management plants, it gives them the primary building blocks to which they can then respond locally, what works in their particular uh, network, what works in their particular commodity that they're mining. So I guess just a bit of a, uh, an indication of, of how it all worked, I guess, to start it off, it was a little bit of silos. And as you can see there, the corporate people had their obligations, um, started off you know, getting us in to investigate, as I mentioned. And their interest, to be honest, at that stage was really towards their legal obligations, what the insurer, what was the regulator thinking, they need to provide a response to the regulator. Um, and then there was a bit of a, uh, discussion with the commodities, the different uh, overarching heads, but they had their own um, interests at that stage. So they were looking at efficiency and targets. So obviously with an instant, that was downtime, um, but they still had this in mind, look, they were still, you know, uh, switched on enough to know that the instant learning needed to take place. Um, but they were also keen on establishing this sort of process and policy that they could roll out. The sites, at the sharp end, they were obviously involved in the initial um, incident. They were involved in this investigation and working out what the root causes were of those crashes and feeding that back up. But they were also interested in the production. So their interest was kind of sort of a fairly immediate. It was at the sharp end. It was reactive. It was unfortunately people, you know, the, the, they knew. Um, and what we got was very little communication between the two. As you can see by the size of the green arrows, there was a little bit chugging back and forwards, but not a huge amount. And the focus was very mixed. Um, people looking at different things that weren't sort of pulling together, um, a bit like the tug of war rope. We really want people pulling together. So from our involvement in there, we certainly became that trusted advisor and things picked up. Um, and as you can see, quite a, a different change of events. So the corporate team suddenly became the enablers. They sort of, sort of the drivers of the whole thing. The sites um, saw their role as the implementation, but importantly, they got that practical feedback role. They got that interest in what they were doing. Um, we got our light bulb moment through working on the particular sites and then the commodities teams in the middle sort of bringing it all together, a bit of a champion role, if you like, in getting these policies and these process documents together, but also getting them implemented on the sites. And I think it was very clear, particularly at our last meeting, that everyone was now sort of pulling together. Everybody talked about, we just need to prevent these incidents from occurring. The corporate team as well were not just interested in what they had to do, what their responsibilities in responding to and reporting as a result of crashes. It was a real, what do you guys need at the site level? What do you need at the commodities level to prevent some of these things happening? That real holistic approach, bring it all together, and really a focus on everybody going home um, at, at night time. So it really was a pleasing change. Um, we acted, I think, a bit of a, as, a, as a bit of glue, if you like, um, but we certainly couldn't uh, do without their, their passion and working forwards and, and unlocking a number of things that they were all doing um, and certainly helping them uh, to move forward. So I, I mentioned in the title, but also our interest in the uh, the Brady Report, the high reliability organisations. And I guess um, our journey with this particular client um, has certainly ticked a few boxes within that. I'm not suggesting they've got the full way there, the long way to go before they could call themselves a high reliability organisation um, by their own uh, admission as well. But certainly they're starting to understand, um, even if they don't know the name of it and what they're trying to achieve, um, mindfulness, they're starting to get a bit of a preoccupation. We need to learn from these. They're reluctant to, to, to simplify. They need to get involved and look at the factors, understand the factors behind, extremely sensitive to the operation and committed to make sure that it's not a uh, incidents that occur, that uh, we bounce back from them um, and we respond to them. Now, deference to expertise, they brought us in. So we're you know, obviously delighted to play our role with that. But they've ticked a number of the boxes themselves towards this journey. So it's just showing, hopefully you can see that how through um, the combined efforts, how we can prevent some of these crashes from occurring in the future 
and that will come from these serious injury crashes. Can we convert some of the serious injury crashes to minor injury crashes? Can we get to our vision zero target down the track? And certainly we think there are a number of things uh, that we can offer, a number of things that the public road network and our lessons that we've learned there can offer um, and the high reliability organisations. Um, I'll close things down now, wrap things up. Um, we really need to investigate these crashes. Um, learning is, is that gift. There's so much to learn from crashes, be it on the uh, public road network to this particular site here, where unfortunately in Western Australia, where there was a fatal uh, crash. And you can see a fairly um, humble road environment, if you like. This is a, a minor um, leg going towards an electrical facility, which is only used once a month. It was stopped off by cones. Unfortunately, um, a trainee who was driving a light vehicle uh, came out of that intersection and collided with a haul truck. Now we got involved with the investigation and the upshot of that obviously was that somebody was killed, somebody lost their lives, the families were involved. Um, but for the organisation concerned, um, it led to three days downtime. Um, and the estimate was a copy of a uh, uh, cost of around about $9 million uh, overall to the organisation. Now, how do we put dollar values on these sort of things? You know, it's a difficult one, and we, you know, we work with this on the road tail, on the public road network, et cetera. But um, horrible story, horrible thing that happens. Everybody wants to go home late at night, but a fairly simple intersection there, but a number of things which could be done to improve. And we came in and provided some uh, improvements to there, but not just for this particular intersection. You know, we squared it all up. We made sure that the intersection of the minor leg was level going and flat and level going into the interface. Um, the haul trucks, there was some signage warning uh, of the approach of the intersection, et cetera, which were things that could also be rolled out at other areas on the site. So it was that systematic improvement, making sure that every, uh, every period there'd be reviews of the network, there are audits done on the network itself. So there are a number of things which we can do. So. This fairly humble, simple site, you know, massive impact on uh, the mine, massive impact on uh, on the people, the local community, etc. Um, so we, yes, we need to save these lives on the roads. Our approach really these days is moving away from that victim blaming approach, um, recognizing that humans make mistakes. We don't nail people for those, then that we. Um, minimize the consequences we have a shared responsibility the people that design the network that manage the network operate it and maintain it um, all have that shared responsibility towards reducing risk um, we try and create that forgiving road environment if something goes wrong can we please have something which is forgiving people aren't running off the road and you know going down sharp drops into uh, water courses striking trees all these sorts of things um, we need to understand that you know, losses of control will occur. Where are they going to occur? Where are people going to run off the road? What can we do to prevent that? So our safe system approach, our holistic approach, not just relying upon individual strands or a silo approach, looking at you know, licensing and admission to the system, looking at vehicles independently, looking at speed independently, looking at all these things together that we possibly can. And that way, hopefully, we can maximise uh, safe mobility. So thank you again for allowing me to present today. Um, hopefully there's something there which will help. Um, I hope you enjoyed the presentation. We tried to keep it uh, nice and visual. Again, no apologies for my keep it real statement. Um, it's what gets me up every morning, single morning to um, try and do what we can to prevent uh, these incidents. You'll have my contact details there. Please feel free to contact me, give me a call, drop me an email if you've got any questions. I know there's a a question collection sort of function uh, for anything that you have today, but very happy to discuss, very happy to uh, you know, clarify any, any thoughts that we've had today or answer any questions that you may have. So thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. Uh, and a very, very timely reminder for a hazard that is very real in our industry. Um, unfortunately, earlier this week, there was a road traffic accident uh, whilst it didn't occur on a mine site, it occurred on a uh, with a truck that was delivering material to a mine site, um, left the left the road, rolled over, and unfortunately, the truck driver um, died as a result of the injury sustained. So it really is a very pertinent message for all of the industry and one that we need to stay on top of. Well, good morning, everyone. My name's Herman Fashing. 
uh, and I'm here to talk to you. Click over. All right. I'm here to talk to you this morning about the, uh, the safety and health performance of the mineral mines and quarry sector. I want to talk about some of the focus areas for the, for the mines inspectorate and some of the initiatives that we're undertaking to ensure that the risk to workers is being effectively managed. I'll remind you about some amendments to the regulations regarding worker health assessment. And finally, I'll provide you with an update on how RSHQ is progressing with implementing the recommendations from the Brady Review. The key metrics that we look at are serious accidents and hypertension incidents. Serious accidents are those that require a person to be admitted to hospital for treatment. They tell us when something has gone wrong. They're a measure of safety performance. Fewer serious accidents equals better performance. The chart that you can see shows surface operations bouncing from 0.2 to 0.4 to 0.6 incidents for every million hours work. It looks like a tiny number, but that number represents real people. 19 people between July 2017 and October 2020 who ended up in hospital as a result of an injury they sustained at work. A further 22 people in underground operations over that same period of time and another 20 in quarries. Quarries are the standout with a persistently high serious accident frequency rate. Though the improvement that you can see this financial year so far is really encouraging I find it difficult to believe that it is accurate and sustainable. I want to see that line continue to drop and I want to see that drop to be sustained. Hypertensional incidents tell us when something has been identified as a problem and reported. So they become a measure of reporting culture as well as learning opportunities. The overall trend is that reporting of HPIs is reducing in the mineral mines and quarry sector. And it looks like that drop is across the board. If the current trend is sustained, we're looking at about a 25% reduction in the number of HPIs reported this year compared to last year, with the quarry sector on track to record just half the number of HPIs. This concerns me, as I believe the reduction is in the number of incidents that are being reported rather than what is actually occurring. The questions I then have is, are these incidents being investigated? Are there controls being put in place? And are we learning? The Mines Inspectorate, we expect to see these numbers trending up. We want to see better reporting. We want to see better learning, not only for the safety of the workers at your site, but so that we can gather data from across the state and identify patterns, trends, and issues that can't easily be identified at a local level. It's those insights that we want to give back to the industry to inform your practices and to reduce the likelihood of your people getting hurt. So bearing in mind the statistics and the information we're looking at, the Mineral Mines and Quarries Inspector currently has three key focus areas. We're looking to reduce the serious accident frequency rate in the quarry sector. We want to improve and increase HPI reporting, investigation quality, and control effectiveness. And we also want to ensure that operators are auditing the effectiveness and implementation of the safety and health management systems that have been established by site senior executives. As shown by the statistics you just saw, the serious accident frequency rate in the quarry sector is significantly higher than that in the remainder of the industry. Analysis of the quarry sector data for serious accidents is problematic because the data set is so small. This means that small changes can have big effects on trends, and it means we need to be a bit careful in drawing conclusions too soon. Also, when we correlate the serious accident data with the high potential incident data, there is a clear indication of underreporting of high potential incidents. And as I've already said, high potential incidents are a learning opportunity, and I am determined that we will do exactly that. The inspectorate strategies to reduce the serious accident frequency rate include attending the site of all serious accidents to ensure that the causes are identified and controls are implemented. Sharing serious accident information through the monthly periodical and other publications. Improving the reporting culture by ensuring that site senior executives and operators understand that all high potential incidents must be reported, not just the ones that are listed in the schedules. And finally, by identifying and specifically targeting sites that have not reported a high potential incident 
to understand if in fact they're not having incidents or they're simply not reporting. There is a correlation between investigation quality and learning. As a result, the Mineral Mines Inquiries Inspectorate is looking more broadly at the investigations that are being undertaken and the nature of the controls being chosen and how effectively these are implemented. Activities that we're pursuing in this area include reviewing the safety and health management systems of selected sites to ensure that it contains procedures and processes which enable workers to be able to report accidents, incidents, high potentials and hazards without fear. It also, to look if it also documents the techniques, the practices and the procedures that the site is going to use to investigate those incidents. And also auditing high potential investigations that have been carried out by sites to assess the thoroughness of that investigation, to establish how the site considered the hierarchy of controls when deciding what controls to implement and ensure that those con chosen controls have actually been implemented and are being monitored for effectiveness. Operator audits are an important way to ensure that the risk to workers at operations is acceptable. This is reinforced by the mine operator obligations that include ensuring that the site senior executive develops and implements a safety and health management system. Auditing and reviewing the effectiveness of the implementation of that safety and health management system and by providing adequate resources and funding to the site senior executive and the site so that they can effectively implement that system. The Mineral Mines Inquiries Inspector has commenced a program of work to examine those audits that have been undertaken by operators to determine the frequency at which they're carried out, examine how those audits determined and decided or otherwise that the safety and health management system was effective and implemented. Where deficiencies that were identified during that audit, we're interested in understanding the nature and type of the controls that were chosen. We want to also understand how and what resources the operator has provided to the site to be able to facilitate the implementation of those controls. And we're also keen to understand what monitoring the operator is undertaking to ensure that they, those controls have been implemented and they are indeed effective. Amendments to the Mine Inquiring Safety and Health Regulation 2017 introduced the requirement for the site senior executive to ensure that respiratory health surveillance is conducted when workers join the industry and at least once every five years after that. Respiratory health surveillance must be conducted by an appropriate doctor and includes a chest X-ray, dual read by qualified radiologists to the international standard, spirometry with comparisons where available, and any other examination that's deemed necessary by the doctor. I want to add a, a point here. Um, this has been said before, and I'll say it again as a clear reminder to industry. The employees and the workers don't pay for these medicals. It is the employer that must pay for those medicals. And where we're identifying circumstances where employees are paying, we will follow up and we will take action. Site senior executives have until the 1st of September 2022 to establish systems and arrangements to ensure that workers have undergone that medical examination that meets those new requirements. A new statutory guideline, QGLO4, has been developed and it details the standards required for those medical examinations and aligns with those required in the coal mining industry. To assist with the introduction of those new requirements, a range of information and supporting material is available on the RSHQ website. This includes template medical examination forms, registers of approved doctors and medical practices, and a range of pocketbook guides and videos. The Brady Hayward Review by Dr. Sean Brady was tabled in Parliament on 6th of February, 2020. The review looked at why mine workers have died over the previous 20 years and how the industry could improve and how the inspectorate could work better. It made 11 recommendations, seven for industry and four for the regulator. RSHQ is committed to implementing all of the recommendations made for the regulator. To address recommendation seven, RSHQ has established a data analytics unit with one of their key functions being to collate, disseminate, analyze and disseminate incident and fatality data to the industry and to the inspectorate. This is being supported by the development of a new IT operating system. Work is underway to address recommendation eight. The IT operating system will include a simplified process to submit accident and incident data via an online portal, and accident reporting will be further simplified by the introduction 
of a single statewide number. Recommendations 10 and 11 have both been implemented. QMI now utilises the serious accident frequency rate as a measure of safety performance and the high potential incident frequency rate as a measure of reporting culture, with both used as performance indicators in reports and published material. While QMI still captures the data required by legislation, we no longer utilise or view the lost time incident frequency rate as an indicator or measure of safety performance. Thank you. And I'd now like to hand you over to Alex Mandel, the Chief Inspector of Explosives. Thanks, Herman. Uh, good morning. The Explosives Inspectorate currently consists of 23 staff in three groups. A field operations team responsible for compliance assurance and community service obligations. A licensing team that performs the required gatekeeping functions and a technical support group that performs planning and performance monitoring, regulatory review and an explosive transport focus. Explosives remain critically important to the Queensland community. Some two and a half million tonnes of bulk explosives are consumed in Queensland each year in the mining industry, plus many more millions of detonators and other initiation equipment. And there are other explosives uses for which we provide regulatory services, including the fireworks industry. To meet our community service obligations, we have conducted nearly 200 explosives recovery tasks where we withdraw explosives and ammunition from the public usually uh, explosives that are voluntarily surrendered. This typically runs to many thousands of items, ranging from commercial explosives to small arms ammunition and explosives chemicals. And we also support the Queensland Police Service by providing them with the identification of explosives and authorities to prosecute in the case of illegal possession and handling of explosives. Licensing forms a gatekeeper function for operating in the explosives industry. The licensing function ensures that authority holders meet the entry requirements for the industry, whether existence of systems and processes, meeting standards or codes of practice, or simply being an appropriate person for access to explosives. In February 2020, a legislation change introduced security clearances and explosives driver's licenses which brought Queensland in line with other states. As at the end of January 2021, in performance of our mainstream explosives regulatory function, we've issued more than 4,000 new security clearances and over 400 explosive drivers licenses. Now in line with the Queensland government's policy focusing on domestic violence and its prevention, security clearances for unsupervised access to explosives will not be issued where a protection order or domestic violence order is current. Indeed, the legislation requires me as Chief Inspector to refuse any such application. To clarify the requirement, we've stated on our application forms that persons should not apply if a protection order or DBO is current. And for this reason, we've refused about half a percent of all applications. I'd like to emphasize this point. Domestic violence is a barrier to entry to working freely in the explosives industry. Criminal history may also be relevant depending on such factors as relevance, that is relevant offenses, severity and recency. It's a fact that approximately 17% of applicants for security clearances have a disclosable criminal history. But we have refused relatively few persons for relevant offences that are part of their criminal history. And finally, on licensing, the transitional period for explosives driver's licences concluded on February 2021. And we now believe that nearly all of the major explosives contractors are compliant.
I'd like now, now like to turn our attention to risk management performance. About 230 incidents have been reported this year, this financial year. Of the reportable incidents, blasting related misfires are the most common, followed by vehicle incidents, whether on mine sites or public roads. Explosive incidents result resulting in a severe or catastrophic outcome are relatively uncommon. They're low probability, high consequence events. If so, why concentrate on incident reports? And the reason is that each of the reported incidents could have, had circumstances been slightly different, resulted in a severe outcome. These reports that we receive from industry and from explosives users constitute a range of high potential near miss records that confirm that the risks exist. The inspector has performed nearly 300 inspections and audits of explosives related facilities and activities to date this financial year. This remains a cornerstone of our role in assuring the community that explosives activities are safe and secure. I'm pleased to report that the use of explosives in the community generally complies with legislation, standards and codes to a high level, as is highly desirable. Key non-compliances, however, are a concerning laxity in basic security, maintenance of mobile processing equipment and the treatment of misfires. And I'd like to emphasize this last point to, by directing your attention to the example statistic on the right, more than 50% and this is quite common, more than 50% of misfire causation is reported to be the result of column dislocation and assumption in most cases, unknown, don't know, or other, don't know. This is not a satisfactory example of a focus on understanding failures. Future risk drivers, changing workforce. We have a loss of competence due to an aging workforce exiting the industry and the availability of training with a concentration in training providers is becoming more difficult to achieve. We have some difficulty in changes for the responsibility for blasting outcomes. At the moment, the legislation says that it's shots for us, but we have blast design and production planning having an influence on the outcome. Drilling and loading also in control of other people other than shot firers, then the shot firer himself. And who's responsible for post-blast issues? Is it the shot firer, the SSC, the contractor? And the blasting contractor or entity has different roles depending on the commercial arrangements in place. We have emerging and arguably in an in a immature technology. There are unconfirmed risk and reliability performances despite the commercial rhetoric associated with, uh, with marketing. There's intensity of commercial competition, which is leading to products being introduced to the market potentially before they are really ready and that risk and reliability performance is fully understood. And more importantly, we have a change in focus from items to systems. The blasting ecosystem now is indeed a system. Whether they are detonators, boosters, or bulk explosives, they constitute a system by themselves, and one now cannot exist without the other. And finally, a risk driver is risk normalization. And this was mentioned by the minister, was mentioned by Paul Hillier, and indeed just about every presenter so far, and I'm sure the rest of them. There is a tendency to normalize risk because of the low frequency and high consequence of catastrophic outcomes. This is something that we need to guard against. In the explosives industry, we see this in the treatment of security incidents and the treatment of misfires. I'd just like to concentrate quickly on misfires. A person I knew in a previous career was, uh, was allocated to a peacekeeping uh, mission in the Sinai. The mission at that time was relatively benign. 
He and his driver were killed when they drove over a landmine dating from the Second World War. So this was in the uh, this was in the 1980s that uh, these two people lost their life. Now, the location of the landmine was not where the landmine was planted, and it was unknown to be there. But they were killed. Why am I talking about this? Because the images on your screen are all potential landmines, and they are created as part of the mining industry because of misfires. We see about 200 to 300 misfire reports each year. Our most significant concern is the probability of undetonated explosives remaining resulting from misfires. The obvious questions are, where is it? Can you fix it or is it in the muck pile? What is it? Bulk explosives or initiating explosives? How much? A detonator, a single booster? or a complete column mass of a tonne or more. Misfire reports in Queensland alone identify thousands of tonnes found during the post-blast mining processes, both surface and underground. So what is the hazard? I'll draw your attention to the middle image, which would be difficult for anybody to see. And this was, uh, this was spotted by an eagle-eyed miner. And there's a number of boosters in pieces covered by uh, black dust or dark gray dust. Those boosters have been uncovered recently, but have not been manufactured for more than 30 years. That's the landmine that remains in your muck pile. And finally, on misfires, here is the outcome that we fear. On the left hand image, there's a shovel loading a haul truck. On the right is an image showing the effects that result from the shovel contacting what is believed to be a 400 gram booster with force. The shovel operator's windscreen was struck with fly off, severely cracked, but luckily remained intact. The haul truck driver sustained a temporary loss of hearing. It could have been much, much worse. 400 grams versus a report last week of a 500, 500 kilogram mass of explosives uncovered. Okay, some emerging uses to close off my presentation. More and more infrastructure. What you see is a diagram of the Cross River, Cross River Rail Tunnel showing uh, areas of blasting. On the left is the vibration influence uh, that has to be planned for. So explosives are being used closer and closer to the community, something for which safety is a paramount concern. Next, defence. It turns out that we now have uh, a responsibility in uh, relation to defence equipment and in particular ammunition. Obviously, larger calibre uh, contain explosives. So on the left, you see Rheinmetall's boxer vehicle and on the right, the facility in Red Bank, which includes a range of explosives uses uh, in the middle of industrial uh, estate. These, these emerging uses are coming very quickly. That facility on the right was built in little more than 18 months. And finally, space. Uh, space, the space industry uses rocket motors. Some of the rocket motors are definitely classified as explosives and we are grappling with legislative change being forecast and the need uh, to exert regulatory control and work with industry so that they continue to prosecute their industry in a safe and secure manner. That concludes my presentation. Uh, thank you for listening. We are now going to go to a break of uh, five minutes, after which um, you'll hear a presentation from Dean Barr from Occupational Health and Hygiene. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Dean Barr. I'm one of the directors from uh, Occupational Health and Hygiene. And this morning, I'm going to go through some of the main care, uh, key areas of work from OHH in 2020. I'm going to give you an update on our cases of mind dust lung disease and close out with an update on our, some of our key projects uh, for 2021. Firstly, our uh, confirmed cases of uh, mind dust lung disease. Uh, as of January this year, we're at 202 confirmed cases reported to RSHQ. 
And these cases are reported uh, through a number of mechanisms, primarily as accepted workers' compensation claims, but also through our compulsory site senior executive reports and our health assessment uh, records under the coal mine workers health scheme. And it's encouraging to see that those reports uh, continue. Uh, given the long latency of disease, we expect those diagnoses to, to continue to come in. And you can see on the right there, the, uh, the annual trend information. And it's important to uh, understand that this is not just about coal workers and pneumoconiosis. This is about a broad range of mine dust lung diseases and to, to understand the different types of exposures that they cause. And uh, Herman mentioned earlier around the changes to regulation for compulsory health surveillance for minimum mine and quarry workers, we expect to see uh, the uh, increase in cases of silicosis over the next 18 months or so uh, to come through. And, and certainly we are seeing an increasing trend in that space at the moment. The other aspect is uh, our reports of straight coal workers pneumoconiosis have uh, plateaued. And some of these other diseases are becoming more prominent in our reported cases. And a case in point there is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. So that's, that's uh, commonly becoming one of the more uh, regular reported disease. And what's interesting about that is that it can be caused by both respirable and inhalable dust. So it's an example of why we need to understand this is, this is, a, this is a broad story under the, the banner of mind dust and lung disease. Another, another mechanism of uh, reported cases comes through our free uh, lung checks for retired and uh, former coal mineral mine and quarry workers. And we've been delivering these since 2019 and we've approved over 100 uh, free checks and 130 of those have been completed. And 18 of our 202 cases have come through that uh, former and retired worker program. And arguably uh, without that program, these cases may not have been detected as early as they have. And it's important we get uh, these retired miners to our approved medical providers so they can have the medicals to the right standard. Another way we're uh, coordinating this is through our new Mind Us Health Support Service. Uh, we partnered with uh, Office of Industrial Relations and Work Cover Queensland last year and launched the, launched the service. And this is about providing a one-stop shop to primarily help, um, miners and their families to get information around the health surveillance process, their uh, uh, workers' compensation rights and uh, accessing counselling service, but also importantly, uh, how to arrange one of these free checks. Another, uh, another way we've been promoting this um, uh, service recently is we were lucky enough to meet a retired coal miner from Ipswich, and Mr Nick Powell was very uh, kind to agree to be filmed and share his story about his career in coal mining and his diagnosis with mine dust lung disease. And in his video, he talks about um, important issues around uh, protections and regular health surveillance. And for those who haven't seen it, I'm going to share that uh, with you now. I'm Mac Powell, and I worked 23 years in the underground pits in Ipswich. They're all good blokes to work with, and uh, they all stuck by each other, no matter what went on, everyone stuck together. That was good, yeah. Oh, I didn't mind working on the lathe turner and that sort of stuff, that was all right. And I'd done a bit of welding, I'd done virtually everything, so I enjoyed most of it. Working conditions were pretty rude, because it was hot and you had, didn't have much air to take all the dust and that away. You only worked in singlets and shorts, and you were wet all day from the sweat, and that was it all day. Oh, you never thought of the hazards from dust and that sort of stuff because you never bother about it, it never come into your head. I was running short of breath and I thought I was just getting old. It just developed a bit from there. I just ran short on breath as the years went by and uh, I just ran out of breath altogether. I ended up going to my private doctor and she wasn't happy with the way my breath was going. So she sent me up to the Ipswich Hospital and I seen the respiratory specialist up there and he put me on oxygen straight away for 24 hours and that was on the Thursday that I seen the doctor and he rang me next morning at 20 past eight and he said you've got black lung. Black lung has affected me quite a lot. Lots of things I can't do that I could do before. I used to overhaul old bike engines and that but I can't do that anymore. I've been looked after by everyone. 
I've had a lot of support from the hospital. They give me a free oxygen machine that goes 24 hours a day. And I've also had to buy a, a portable machine, so I bought this one. And the uh, compo paid me back for it. Five and a half grand for that. So I can move around the yard, go down the shed and that sort of stuff. There will be a lot of blokes around with black lung from them years because it's a long time to be working in the pits and not get tested. Anyone starting in the industry nowadays, and before they started, go and get a proper deep chest X-ray to see what your lungs are like and that, and make sure they're right before you even start, and get them checked while you're working as well to make sure you haven't developed anything while you're doing it. Being lax about black lung is pretty stupid because if you don't think you you can catch it and you're bulletproof, as they say. That's not right, so just make sure you do get your checks done and live up to it it's for your own sake anyway. Uh, we're, we're very grateful for, uh, to Mr. Powell's family to agree to, to, to shoot that video and uh, and that is now available uh, online on our website under Minus Health Matters portal and also on our social media uh, channels, uh, LinkedIn, Facebook, if you want to use that further. One of, the, one of the ways we're ensuring that cases like Mr Powell's are detected uh, as early as possible is through our uh, regulation of uh, medical providers under the Coal Mine Workers Health Scheme. And this stems back to the Monash uh, Review report from 2016 that uh, under Recommendation 7, uh, directed that uh, medical providers uh, should be contracted to a much smaller pool who are approved uh, to undertake these e examinations. And this is all around uh, quality control and ensuring that those undertaking these exams are focused on doing this work to, to the right standards. And to, to implement uh, that recommendation in 2017, we uh, launched a voluntary register where doctors and employers uh, agreed to, to, to use a voluntary register and that was later embedded in regulation in 2019 um, that those uh, uh, providers approved by RSHQ uh, must be used under the Coal Mine Workers Health Scheme. And at that time, those uh, medical providers that transitioned had two years to then apply formally under the regulation uh, and be approved. And that two year uh, period ends in a couple of weeks on the 1st of, of March. So it's been a lot of work for OHH in recent months uh, progressing that, uh, those applications through. And in 20, 2019, when that uh, regulation change was made, we had about 700 uh, medical providers uh, come across from the voluntary register. And that included uh, doctors, spometry practices, x-ray clinics, radiologists, examining medical officers, and they had that two years. So um, as of this month, um, we're looking at a conversion rate of about 55% of those that will transition across to the register and remain uh, at one March. Um, so uh, this, is, this is about, um, uh, continuing to sustain that Monash recommendation and, uh, and, and focusing on those practices that are uh, focusing on this work. And to just give you an, in, an indication of the breakdown of those various providers, the, uh, the key, the key um, provider that has the least transition is uh, x-ray clinics at around 30% conversion rate, followed by doctors and spirometry practices as around 50%. And the, the map on the right there shows in the blue pins, those that are converting across. You see, we've still got really good coverage across Queensland and even interstate. And the orange pins are those that aren't. And they're primarily uh, X-ray clinics in other states that have chosen to drop off. The other a large part of our work uh, last year is around rolling out our quality control program in, uh, in, in audits across our providers. And this is complementary to our upfront accreditation and registration process about getting approved with RSHQ. So we wanna make sure that the outcomes are being delivered and we're getting quality medical results. And we're doing that through two forms of audit, a clinical audit and administrative. And in the clinical audit space, we're looking at spirometry tests, chest X-rays, compliance with the clinical pathway. And also last year, we had some experts look at uh, the CT. In addition, in administrative audit, we've engaged Nancy Young to audit a sample of our um, approved providers to ensure those requirements and the standards that are administrative nature, such as maintenance and calibration uh, requirements, cleaning, uh, technical specifications and equipment type, those are also being 
adhere to on the ground. Now, this is the uh, first phase of our audit program that we've been running. So it will, uh, we will be learning from that as we go and making adjustments so that we ensure we're delivering the most effective uh, and efficient audit program going forward. One of those uh, clinical audits I want to go into a bit more detail for you is our spirometry clinical audit. And we've engaged the Rassic Society of Australia and New Zealand to do that for us, the TSANS. And in 2020, uh, TSANS uh, audited 45 of our approved practices, uh, which included uh, almost 3,000 spirometry tests. And as a result of that, we worked through those results. So far, we've identified over 100 spiro tests that likely need to be repeated and 100, over 100 reports that need to be reviewed. So we're providing those, uh, those results through to those group practices and following, that, uh, following those up. And we're also sharing the, the learnings um, from that audit more broadly with all, that, all our group practices. Now, the great benefit of, of these audit programs in contrast to um, uh, a scenario without um, quality health surveillance and quality control systems is that we will see an overall quality increase in spirometry across the scheme. And that's really important because one of our uh, components of our clinical pathway is uh, comparative is a comparison between current past spirometry. So having high quality spirometry make, makes our diagnostic process that more accurate. Also working to ensure our education and awareness uh, material is up to date. And, uh, and last year we updated our online uh, videos and content and pocketbook guides to ensure they appeal to the broader audience of mineral mine and quarry workers in addition to the coal industry. So if you haven't seen those yet, jump online. Uh, the videos are all new and our pocketbooks are updated as well. And those pocketbooks can be downloaded electronically or free hard copies can be ordered for us and from us. And they've been quite popular. We've, we've sent out tens of thousands of those in the last couple of years. I'd now like to move on some of our key operational projects uh, we'll be delivering in 2021. And the first one is uh, ResHealth. Now ResHealth is our new digital health records management system. And we're really um, excited to announce that um, we launched that uh, two weeks ago with some early adopters. And the great thing about this system, it'll allow each, uh, each participant in the health assessment process on the Commonwealth Workers Health Scheme to enter their component uh, uh, in a secure online environment where that information comes directly through to RSHQ's database. Uh, we're very grateful to Dr. Ogle at King Roy for being our first uh, doctor to, to uh, register and start using uh, ResHealth and our other uh, early adopters. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, please stay tuned uh, in the coming months that we'll be starting to uh, gradually onboard more doctors and employers uh, onto, onto ResHealth and, um, and, and then broader uh, providers uh, uh, into, the, into the year. Now, this isn't just an RSHQ system. This is a system for everyone. This is really about improving the quality of data and reliability and accuracy of data. So whether you're an employer, doctor or worker, this is for everyone. So we're really excited about this um, project. Uh, next one I want to talk about is our mobile health unit. Uh, last year, we partnered with Dr. Rolf Gomes and Heart of Australia to deliver a mobile health service for uh, Queensland's regional coal, middle mine and quarry workers. And uh, this, this is a really exciting uh, project because uh, it'll be an Australian first uh, service delivering the full range of medical examinations required under the common with this health scheme. But most significantly, it'll include a, a full size, um, a full bed CT scanner. And that means that if any of those, uh, any of the uh, screening results are abnormal, those higher order diagnostic tests can be done there and then on site. Uh, the image you can see there uh, on the right is one of Dr. Gomes' earlier trucks, and this is what this new uh, vehicle will look very similar to. And the photo on the left is a, uh, an update on the construction of the new, uh, new trailers. And you can see the frame and chassis are completed and the, frame and the panels will be going on next. Uh, this service will hit the road later in 2021, and if you are interested in having some early conversations with Heart of Australia, they're very open to that, so I encourage, encourage you to do so. And the final project uh, I want to cover is our broad resources occupational health risk assessment. And there's a lot of health related activities going on across industry and RSHQ. And uh, Bill will talk about some of those happening in the and gas inspector next. But what this project is to make sure we've got a coordinated uh, and uh, documented approach to uh, how uh, current and emerging health risks are being controlled across industry and how they're being regula regulated uh, by RSHQ. 
And we're going to do this in three, three phases. The first one is a literature and a data review. We'll then do stakeholder consultation. And finally, we'll look at those inputs and identify any gaps where we can then uh, prioritise uh, and uh, um, uh, resource those accordingly. So um, stay tuned for that as well. And in the coming months, we'll be uh, um, I'm going to talk to you more about that consultation phase. That's it for me. Thank you very much for your time this morning. I'll now hand over to Bill Date, our Chief Inspector of the Petroleum Gas Inspector. Thank you. Yeah, morning, everybody. Uh, Bill Date's my name. Slide, please. Okay, a couple of key messages from the Petroleum and Gas Inspector. You heard the CEO speak about zero serious harm. In the inspectorate, we 150% support this aspiration. And I'll return to this theme later in the presentation. Compliance. Now, I'm going to use the acronym of RIPA. First of all, reporting. Understand your reporting obligations under 767, Section 706 of the Act and carry them out. Some of these reporting obligations are personal on the key appointee, such as the operator under the Petroleum and Gas Act. A positive reporting culture is healthy because it'll help us learn and avoid a reoccurrence of incidents. I, investigate. We investigate fatalities, serious harms and dangerous occurrences. We will deploy to site and we'll use techniques such as ICAM and Nature and Cause to understand who, what, where, and most importantly, why. Proportionate. Our actions are guided by our publicly available compliance policy. Factors such as conduct, the nature of the, the potential for harm, have a significant bearing on an inspector's compliance action, such as issuance of a notice or a directive or a penalty infringement notice or a recommendation even for a higher level sanction. Repeat, we don't want to see a reoccurrence of similar or the same incidents from different sites, different sites under different operators and contractors. And in the downstream world, the gas work license holder, we don't want to see a reoccurrence of similar offences by individuals who have that obligation. So repeat in those two contexts. My final bullet point is about collaboration. We will collaborate with industry to understand and to solve problems. Slide. This is the span of the Queensland petroleum and gas industry. Many of you in the audience have seen this before, but my regulatory obligations under the Act stream into, sorry, span the community and to 10 years. So look at the right-hand side of the diagram, the right-hand lips. The Petroleum and Gas Inspectorate licenses and regulates approximately 6,500 gas fitters right throughout the state who do gas work in your homes, such as hot water systems, stoves, coffee roasters, et cetera, and in businesses, caravans and camper vans. So 6,500 gas fitters, I call the downstream industry. And they, they undertake these activities primarily in the suburbs and in the towns around our state. Go to the left-hand ellipse, the red ellipse. This is more, this is characterized as the upstream industry that many of you in the audience are involved in right now. So, for instance, I'll highlight the 9,000, approximately 9,000 production wells, gas processing facilities such as Kenya, Reedy Creek, and Fairview in the upstream world. And this is largely activity based on petroleum or exploration leases. And in terms of the span, let me I'll draw your attention to hydrogen. This is a new and emergency, emerging, exciting industry sector. And we co regulate this with workplace health and safety. So we're seeing now coming into the state, you know, fuel, hydrogen fuel cells in transport and other projects that will come on stream in the, in the near future, in the next 12 to 24 months and beyond. So that's the span of the industry. Go to the next, next slide. Okay. Problem solving. The PNG under, uh, inspectorate undertakes proactive worker health projects. Two years ago, we considered uh, what we needed to deep dive into, and that was a deep dive at looking into airborne contaminants associated with fracking operations. In Queensland, about 250 wells are fracked a year. 
So that's a significant body of work in the upstream industry. In 2018, using our partners at Simtars and their expertise, we undertook respirable dust and silica monitoring at fracking sites in the Surat Basin. Workers at those sites were fitted with sampling devices that monitored their personal respirable dust and silica exposure during the extended periods of work shifts. We've zeroed in on silica given the insidious nature of potential silicosis. In addition to that sampling, qualitative surveys, questionnaires and filming was undertaking of worker behaviours and activities over a three to four day period at each site. Now in 2018, these re results uh, highlighted some exceedances. Exceedances in terms of 0.5 parts per million respirable crystalline silica under the operator's global safety management system. There was an over-reliance on lower order controls, ministry of controls and PPE that was not well fitted for purpose on the worker. Compliance action was taken and the two major fracking contractors developed action plans. We stepped forward into 2020. Again, with Simtar's expertise, we repeated the sampling exercise I described earlier. Now the industry action plan sought to reduce risks as low as practical and included the use of the powered air respirators in the bottom right hand of the, uh, the, the graphic and it higher order engineering controls. So in the, in the right hand side picture, the, the work of the controls, the bulk sand moving device at a fracking site was encapsulated inside a HEP controlled air conditioned cabin of a front end loader and that worker was also wearing the upgraded power air respirator. So two barriers to keep that worker effectively controlling the task from an elevated platform that the workforce had designed. The result then was compliance then with the law of 0 0.5, 0 0.5 parts per million RCS. And it's a positive health outcome because we believe we have reduced the potential for long-term negative health impacts on workers associated with fracking operations. Notwithstanding this, we will remain vigilant. We will spot check and we will continue to inspect this so that there is no long-term health impact and the risks are being managed by operators as low as reasonably practical. Slide. A regulator should be efficient. Audits, if I go to the left-hand picture, we understand that audits take time, effort and resources by operators and the regulator. Now, some gas plants in Queensland are co-regulated by the inspectorate and workplace health and safety. So in 2020, a joint approach has been used for some audits. For example, a joint audit was undertaken of the QCLNG plant on Curtis Island. Now we'll continue with this regulatory efficiency approach in the past, we've undertaken well site inspections using the experts at the Electrical Safety Office. We've undertaken some construction site inspections with the Queensland Building Construction Commission, QBCC. And we intend to explore opportunities with the environmental regulator um, to have a look at when we undertake uh, fracking inspections and audits to see if we, can, again, can use that approach for those tasks. I'll go to the right-hand side of the picture. We regulate biogas. There are about 80 sites in Queensland, and this is growing. We've under, we're undertaking right now this financial year, proactive health risk assessments, of, and we'll do that of, of four sites over the next three years. These sites include landfill, meat processing works, water treatment facilities. We want to check that risks are being managed as low as reasonably practical. We want to ensure that workers are not being exposed to unforeseen or invisible harms. And I think of an emerging harm not seen two years ago, and that is the reports in the media about fragments of COVID detected in some sewage treatment plants around Queensland. So that's an exciting, is it, uh, an exciting and should be a highly informative program of work in terms of health risk assessments. Slide. Okay. No presentation would be complete without a look at some data. On the left-hand table, I, I, the, on, on the left-hand side of this diagram is the, our core work, 
Our core work is proactive safety inspections and audits. And I could just portray for you on the slide a picture of the last three years worth of our effort. So we undertake safe, proactive safety inspections. Two years ago in 2019, 1100, thereabouts, 2020, uh, 1200. And next year, I'm thinking that will be another slight increase in trajectory. The techniques we use for these safety inspections include limited notice, no notice and night time. And in fact, last Thursday night, along with my uh, inspectors, I joined them at a rig inspection at an origin site um, at, that went to about 2,200 hours last Thursday night. In terms of audits, we undertake about 70 audits approximately each financial year. And audits are a flagship output where we have a deep dive and examine elements of an operator's safety management system. The focus areas are well communicated to industry in advance. Not the detail, but the focus areas. So right now we're having a look at well integrity, decommissioning, plug and abandon, and leak management, all important aspects of an operator's safety management system. Let me go to the right-hand side of the graphic, the blue bar charts. We've had six non-work related fatalities in the past four years. Four heart attacks, one acute asthma, and one brain aneurysm. Each represents a person, a husband, a father, a son, a cousin. Now we've done health risk assessments. We've done fracking, as I mentioned before. We've done rigs. We're doing biogas right now. Dean mentioned before the strategic health risk assessment that OHH will undertake to look at the, rel the whole resource sector. And I'm aware that Safer Together has developed a fitness for work standard. Now these are all positive steps, but the inspectorate will maintain a focus on fit and healthy workforce. Slide. Slide. The unintended loss of containment of gas and its connection to a uh, combination with the exposure to ignition, ignition source can have catastrophic and devastating consequences on a worker. I think that's evident from the, the picture sustained by this individual. These can have serious impacts uh, in, in the workplace, but also in the community. And that ties back to a, my community service obligation under the Act. Now this uh, incident of alleged unlicensed gas work that occurred in Southeast Queensland in 2020 is being investigated right now. And subject to the satisfactory completion of this investigation into this alleged gas work, uh, alleged unlicensed gas work, and with due consideration by the Workplace Health and Safety Prosecutor, we will seek to apply the full weight of the law against the alleged perpetrator. Mm. The aspiration that we have of zero serious harm in industry and, and in the community in relation to PNG drives our inspections and audits. It most motivates me personally for work to come to work every day. I never want to see anybody hurt like this gentleman in this photo. We want to see everybody get home safely after each shift. So I'd hope that the industry would join RSHQ in doubling down on their efforts to, to move towards this lofty aspiration and vision of zero serious harm in the workplace and for, for the PNG inspector in the community. Now on that very sombre note, I'll conclude my PNG update today and I thank you for your attention over the last 15 minutes. It's my absolute pleasure now to introduce Nick Orstrand, the Executive Director of Simtars, a really important partner for the PNG Inspectorate. And uh, prior to joining Simtars as the boss, Nick was a principal consultant at Parsons Brink Bill. Nick, I invite you to address the audience. Thank you, Bill. Thanks for the very kind introduction. And you'll certainly um, be a challenge to follow, but I will attempt to do my best. Um, so my presentation aims to highlight how the work Simtars does ultimately um, aligns with RSHQ's strategy. We do this through delivering a suite of test, testing, engineering, scientific and training services that ultimately enhance industry safety, health and safety outcomes. Furthermore, we actively support emergency preparedness and response, and we sponsor and undertake research aligned to our research strategy. So what's that mean in practice? Well, I'll take you through the, the programs of work that we're currently delivering. This 
this calendar year. So statutory competency. So CIMTARS is a registered training organisation or RTO uh, and uh, registered therefore with the Australian Skills Quality Authority. We feel competency gaps in industry and work with industry stakeholders such as the inspectorate, the board of examiners, unions, the QRC and universities to inform the design of our training and assessment strategies. And we are supporting the next generation of mining professionals through delivering a suite of statutory training competencies that include the ERZ or Deputy Program, First Class Mine Managers Program, the Ventilation Officer Coal Program, and the Ventilation Officer Met Mine Program. We prepare candidates through a series of uh, workshops and mock examinations to better equip them to pass examinations ultimately with the Board of Examiners. It's early in Simtar's journey. However, our first two candidates to complete the deputies course passed their oral examination with the Board of Examiners in December last year, first time round. We envisage our RTO will secure leading pass rates with the BIOE, thus validating the design and delivery of our statutory programs, but more importantly, ensuring our graduate trainees are fulfilling and well equipped to undertake their role, critical role, I might add, in the industry. We work across the entire spectrum to support smaller mineral mines and quarries, and this was recently highlighted by an online SSC awareness training program for small operations, together with an online dust awareness training that we developed in conjunction with Herman Bashing and his team. <clears throat> in response to the coal workers' pneumoconiosis inquiry, in quarter one, 2017, Simtar's designed and delivered the monitoring respirable dust in mines program. It's pleasing to note that to date, uh, we've delivered, we've, uh, sorry, issued 431 statements of attainment for that. And we are still the only provider in the industry that is undertaking that training program. We will always put our product before our profit. That is the beauty of being a public, public service entity with a registered training organisation. Unlike a lot of the other commercial providers, revenue is not overly important to us. Critical controls. I'll now talk to you briefly about our uh, safe gas, real-time gas monitoring solution. So this is a real uh, research success story for Simtars and ultimately for in industry. The original platform was developed by Simtars some 25 years ago as a result of the Maurer 1994 mine disaster and, this, and the, the amendments made to the regulation as a result. It forms an integral part of the mine's safety and health management systems and management plans, trigger action response, and supports Simtar's emergency response capability. It does meet the requirements of the Coal Mine Safety and Health Act and regulation. And again, it's critical in managing this risk in underground operations. We have invested heavily in this, uh, this program. So we've recently spent in the order of about $1.2 million doing a complex lift and shift from an access database to an SQL database. We have rolled this out to nine priority sites <clears throat> uh, and we are due to complete the remaining non-priority sites by Q3 this year. Version four, where it has been rolled out, it has really validated uh, the specification benefits of that program of works. So what's that mean? We've got a stabilised and scalable database is significantly less susceptible to corruption. We've got reduced support calls coming in. We've got increased data capture and of course, end user efficiency gains that not only benefit us, but of course, more importantly, our customer base. This program of works was successfully delivered on safety time, cost and quality objectives, which is no small feat given the technical nature and at times the arduous rollout conditions associated with upgrades. To the future, Safe Gas version five roadmap is currently being developed and takes into consideration our industry discussion paper that we sought feedback from in Q3 last year. This feedback essentially validates that we are online in terms of our prioritised features and functionality. Some of the high level plan benefits of V5 are ultimately functional improvements in support and mobility, web enablement and increased monitoring capabilities. Emergency response. So again, as a result of the Mara 99, 1994 mine disaster, recognised standard eight, conduct of a mine emergency exercise was established. 
This aims to test the ability of KILMRS and all other external agencies together with the Mine Safety and Health Management System to respond to an emergency. The 2020 Level 1 uh, exercise was chaired again this year by Simtar's Executive Mining Engineer, Martin Mockinson, and conducted at the Moorumbah North Mine in December. It was the 23rd Level 1 exercise held in Queensland. 29 assessors participated from all stakeholders, some of which included QMRS, Industry Safety and Health Reps, the Sustainable Minerals Institute with the University of Queensland, the Office of the Commissioner, the Inspectorate, Simtars, and six uh, Queensland coal mine operators. The Level 1 report is due to be published in March this year, and as always, I would encourage you all to take the time to review the report's recommendations in order to collectively improve industry's emergency response capability. In May 2020, Simtars was the first responder to the Grosvenor River. We deployed our mobile gas lab together with our analytic, analytical chemists. Our mobile gas lab continues to be utilised on site <clears throat> and we provided over 3,000 hours or 259 days of 24 hour round the clock support to that response. We continue to provide remote support and we also mobilised our scan team using our Leica point cloud scanner to scan the, scan the area to capture that for future knowledge and reporting. We continue to undertake technical investigations and in regards to electrical and calibration. So we have spent in the order of about 7,000 hours to date responding to the Grover event. And of course, that is critically important for us. It's our key purpose and it will always be our first priority. Simtar has worked closely with the Queensland Mines Rescue Service and is a sponsor of the UK Healy Cup, the Memorial Cup and the National Mines Rescue Comp. We actively work with them in supporting the delivery of their critically important Mine Emergency Management Systems course. So we continue to persist in honouring our most critical purposing activity, 24 hour on-call emergency response support. So health compliance. Um, Simtars supports industry by undertaking a full complement of occupational hygiene services, coupled with our uh, analytical services on a commercial basis to support operators achieve their reporting obligations. As Bill mentioned earlier, Simtars continues to undertake health risk assessments in PNG, and we are soon to embark upon hazardous area zone and installation of audits of two sites in conjunction again with Bill and the petroleum and gas industry. We're also uh, in the process of obtaining Prestabolite accreditation with the National Association of Testing Authorities, or more commonly known as NADA. This accreditation will extend our existing suite of silk crystalline silica analysis and demonstrates to industry Simtar's competence, reliability, and commitment to quality. We provide the complementary offering of highly qualified and skilled occupational hygienists, coupled with our NADA accredited laboratory to undertake detailed analysis. Our goal is to be viewed as a local centre of excellence in airborne contaminants, and I am confident that this can be realised. We are well on our way. Simtars continues to provide input, technical input rather, into recognised standards and uh, QGLO, recognised standard 14 rather, and QGLO 2. This work develops our competency base and data set to support research programs and ultimately improve worker health outcomes. Research, clearly it is one of our founding purposes at Simtars and we do have a research strategy in place. We have had that in place for a number of years now. It defines key, four key focus areas, being health, safety, emergency response and emergency preparedness. It is time that we independently test the validity of our research strategy. And to aid in that, I'm delighted to announce that Dr. Sean Brady, who of course you'll all be familiar with, has agreed to chair Sintar's Research Advisory Committee. We're in the process of finalising the committee constitution with the, aim, with the aim to focus on consolidating our research program through deeper collaboration, with the view to expediting more favourable research outcomes to meet current, emerging and future issues needs of industry. Locally, Simtas is undertaking a suite of research programs uh, commissioned by ACARP, uh, eight of in total, and I would like to thank ACARP again for their ongoing support to our research efforts. We deliver those programs with uh, local ecosystem partners. So again, entities like 
the Sustainable Minerals Institute, Queensland University of Technology, mine operators, original equipment manufacturers, CSIRO. We also leverage a global ecosystem of partners to return benefit to the Queensland industry. Currently, we are working with entities like NIOSH and MSHA in the USA, the HSC in the UK, and in India, we're delivering our spontaneous combustion program, program for the Indian School of Mines, which will inevitably form a research part, partnership once that is conditioned. All the work that we undertake in the international arena ultimately returns benefit to the Queensland industry. Albeit short, I hope my presentation validates that Sintars is aligned to RSHQ's key strategic objective of promoting improved safety and health outcomes through delivering engineering, scientific and training services, whilst actively supporting emergency response capability and undertaking research. Simtar's unique position in industry enables us to leverage both a local and global ecosystem of partners to stay at the forefront of safety and health. We support all regulatory arms within RSHQ to enhance industry safety and health outcomes, and we continue to honour our founding purpose whilst building our industry's relevance and significance. All of this work clearly demonstrates that Simtars is supporting RSHQ to achieve its vision of zero serious harm. That concludes my presentation and I'll now hand you over to Peter Newman, Chief Inspector's Commons. As a leader, whether you're the CEO, SSE, UMM, Inspector of Mines, an official of a representative body, or a coal mine worker. You're all leaders in your organisation, having the power to influence the organisation at a company, mine, shift, or workplace level. The way you demonstrate that leadership, the discipline you accept, in that workplace will set the culture of the organisation. Your leadership and discipline will set the culture which will significantly impact the health and safety of coal mine workers. Today, I'll share three key areas of interest in improving health and safety in our industry. The first is around high reliability organisations. What's our view from the industry's performance and us as a regulator? Secondly, the industry performance in the area of high potential incidents, serious accidents, and the reporting of that performance. And then finally, moving on to moving forward about improving our capability and capacity as a regulator and the focus areas we'll have for industry. High reliability organisations, behaviours and challenges. Corporate memory is fading. It's up to you and us as leaders in this industry to cure this memory loss and ensure that corporate memory does not fade away. Too soon we forget the lessons of the past. I put it to you that organisations that have adopted the HRO principles have active corporate memory, an ongoing sense of chronic unease. They celebrate their failures and continually learn from them and others. I'd like you to reflect for a moment, to remember Donald Rabbit killed at the Curra mine in an everyday activity of changing earth moving tires on the 12th of January, 2020. The five coal mine workers who suffered serious burns and are still undergoing ongoing treatment for those injuries in the explosion underground at the Grosvenor mine on the 6th of May, 2020. And lastly, the reduction in coal price and what impact it has on the mindfulness of your coal mine workers. What are you doing in the HRO space? When is your next safety reset and what will be the driver? 
a fatality anniversary, learnings from failure, outside influences beyond your control, but impacting on the coal mine workers on your side? Or are you waiting for someone else to drive it? I have three key observations on industry's performance as HROs. The first is around the principle of preoccupation with failure. Some of my colleagues have talked about normalisation of HPIs. In the underground sector, we've seen a clear normalisation of gas exceedances in the past and the consequences of that. In the open cut area, normalisation of misfires, normalisation of unplanned movements, both having the ability to result in multiple serious accidents. In the sensitivity to operations, listening to coal mine workers and walking the tour. Supervision. In one of my later slides, I'll go into some work we've been do doing across the industry with respect to how well we're performing in terms of supervision. A key part of Brady's report some 12 months ago and a key part of the report out of WA into their fatalities. And the last, last one is deference to expertise. Expertise rather than authority taking precedence. And I have to say, this is in the area of risk management and my inspectors and myself from personal experience going to mine sites. See that the risk assessments being done in the industry today on principal hazards are looking for an outcome rather than the discipline of finding the control, the hazards and the controls required to be implemented. No longer are external facilitators with the skills required to run those important risk assessments being brought into mine sites and organisations. It's being done by an on-site superintendent. The, the selected cross-section of the workforce that are being used for those risk assessments. Invariably, there's no external expert being brought in to ask the question, what is the emperor wearing today in terms of his clothes? In my first 12 months in this role, I've visited, visited now every mine where the three fatalities occurred in the 12 months prior to the 12th January in 2020. At Saraji, Morumbai North, Baralabar, Cabra Downs, Middle Mount Coal and Curra. The question I wanted answered for myself was that, was there chronic unease still evident on those sites? and was corporate memory still alive? Because if it didn't exist on those sites, the industry had a real challenge. Can I say my assessment of it was 50-50 at best? A sad indictment on some of those mines and resulted in a number of directives associated with some of the observations during those inspections. I'll now, now move on to performance of the industry. We've had the lowest reporting of HBIs in four years, a 20% reduction this year on the previous years. Brady in his report some over 12 months now ago mentions a reporting culture being critical to improve performance, learning from failures. How can we do that when we're reducing the number of HBIs being reported? Our observations as an inspectorate is there's a relationship to the SSE that, that is operating on that mine. I'll share with you some of our heat maps. But in one particular case, a new SSE, SSE came, was appointed and there was a 50% drop in HPIs on that site. Can I say the site's performance wasn't improving? And it took inspectors to undertake a forensic review of the site instance reporting to uncover the fact that there were incidents occurring on that site that weren't being reported to HPIs. In the mind of the SSE, it's just part of mining. 
but the learnings for industry were lost. So one of our projects that one of the regional inspectors is doing is looking at those, doing a forensic review of those sites where HBI reporting is reducing. This is a HBI in anybody's book. In any part of the world, someone explained to me how that's not reported as an HPI. But can I say there's an SSE out there that didn't believe it was? It was just part of mining. Let's get serious. We'll continue to educate in terms of what are HPIs and engage with mines. We'll look to correct behaviour where HBIs aren't being recorded. But ultimately, if that doesn't work, we'll start, we'll, we will look at deterrent actions and ultimately be punitive if the leadership and discipline demonstrated doesn't change. Why? Because without it, a cancer will grow within the culture of those organisations and serious harm will occur. The next performance indicator is serious injuries. 45% reduction in the serious injury frequency rate. The question is, is it predictable, inaccurate, or should we celebrate it? We've had over 12 months without a fatality in the coal industry. Those two things gives me chronic unease. Brady said, it's predictable. We took 56,000 coal mine workers and stopped the industry for a safety reset. There was a strong focus. Corporate memory was heightened during this period. But can I say that there are numerous very near misses. Some clear cases, as I say, of normalizations of HPIs in the industry. 201 reports coming in with administered controls. Correction, corrected actions not closed out when my inspectors go to site. Poor standards of investigation, little, little ever, evidence of deference to expertise, a preoccupation to simplify and purely report it as operator error. The dice have been thrown a number of times in the last 12 months. With gas exceedances across the industry, gas ignition, gas ignitions, gas explosions, structural failures in walkways of processing plants, which but for the dexterity of the operator hanging on to the railing, in one case would have fallen eight and a half metres as the walkway slipped away from underneath it. Fires on equipment, lightning strike, unplanned movements, 200 metre movement of a truck down a ramp out of control and misfires. So the other question is, is it under reporting? From recent complaints, investigations into those complaints and investigations into the serious, serious accidents and interviews, we're, we're starting to see a trend where people are saying, old mate got hurt underground and was told to see the, see the roster out in this, trip, in this camp room and go and see your GP when you get home and may end up ultimately going to hosp into a hospital. But by then, the incident has been forgotten, it's been classified, and it's another day on the mine site. It used to be lost time injury frequency rate behaviour, and we're all well aware of what was done in terms of ensuring we didn't have an LTI on the site, irrespective of the fact that the incident occurred. The question now is that behaviour finding its way into the serious injury frequency rate. So as a regulator, we're now working with Queensland Health to do our own forensic look through their tra trauma register into regions and into organisations and into mines to validate the information that we have been provided by industry. 
And I'd ask you as leaders of the industry to look into your organisations at a corporate level down to a mine site level as to what's being done. I mentioned about supervision. It's certainly been a key focus area for the inspectorate over the last 18 months and will continue to be so. 18 months ago, we started a program of interviewing hundreds of supervisors as part of our inspection regime. What we found, supervisors on sites, 100% success rate of being appointed and assessed as competent. Did they have the ComShack assigned competencies? 97% of them did. Did they have the competency for the activity that they were being supervised? 89%. Practical experience, 97%. Competency refreshed within five years of the appointment, 92%. Some of you may be out there thinking, Newman, 97% is not a bad success rate. Can I say that 3% of one site, which had reported to me of over 300 supervisors on that site, says that there could have well be 10 supervisors who didn't have the competencies. They didn't have the um, practical experience in the tasks that they were supervising. And the holes in the Swiss cheese start to line up. Then further, the alarming statistic is that of those interviews, 63%, only 63% of the, of the supervisors were getting enough time to, to be out on the, on the floor talking to coal mine workers and supervising the work that they were responsible for supervising. Another hole is just lined up. So what's the last line of defence? It's the coal mine worker. But it may be the coal mine worker that's trying to do the right thing by himself, his mates or the organisation in getting the job done. The last hole is just lined up. This is a heat map which uh, myself and my um, leadership team use to look at where we're going to place our resources across the industry and focus. Yes, it drives our focus areas, but it also drives those mines that we're going to be looking, looking to increase our frequency of inspections and audits associated with the performance of that mine. It may be because, as I mentioned earlier, HBIs aren't being reported at the frequency they were previously. But it may be that the number of HBIs has actually doubled you can't see the number here, but one of the surface mines there in terms of vehicle interactions from one year to the next went from 24 to 47. The question is, is the mine site aware of that? First question to be asked, is chronic unease evident on that mine site? Because if it is, they would be. So in terms of focus areas, I mentioned misfires, Gas exceedances continue, irrespective of the, the explosions at, at Grosvenor, continue in the red area. And the red area are those areas where there's at least one HBI per month through the 12 month period. Fires continue to be an issue across the, across the industry and Pat Hurley, a mechanical inspector is certainly working with mines in that area. But the focus areas are certainly around gas management, gas unplanned movements, and underpinned with supervision and risk management. I'll now move on to improving performance. Just touch on the Board of Examiners. The Board has had a uh, renewal in the last um, six months with new members coming onto the Board and taking over from some of the great work was, was done by some of the previous members of the board. We've got a new strategic plan, a new business plan to work to, and looking at improving engagement with industry and applicants as part of improving the success rate of candidates coming forward. 
as you can see, in the last 18 months, we've seen a, a big kick up in terms of deputies, certificates of competency, and OCE starting to kick up as well. And I've got to congratulate some of the uh, some of the operators in terms of their preparation of those classes of those people being coming forward for their their orals. But conversely, and though people know who they are out there because I've recently written to them, um, of those those minds where people are being put forward who, quite honestly, are not ready and not with the skills and experience and knowledge to sit for their orals. The concern is still around first and second class tickets. And you can see over the last six years, it's been a snake on the, on the ground with one to two first class tickets. As an inspectorate, as an inspectorate and a regulator, we've commenced a program, a development program for a cohort of four inspectors to bring them forward from their current certificates of competency to prepare them for their first class ticket. I'd ask you at an industry, what is your co cohort and how are you progressing that? There are many tools available to us as a regulator. And in the last 12 months, we've certainly accessed most of them. The Wheel of Fortune, or to some misfortune, um, after Malcolm Sparrow out of the Harvard, um, out of uh, Harvard in the US, a world expert on um, regulatory compliance and enforcement, shows the number of different regulatory um, tools available to us. As RSHQ, in our compliance policy, we're very much around education in the first instance moving to correction, deterrent or punitive action should, um, should people or organisation not, not respond. During the year, a, um, a senior official of one organisation asked me whether I'd, there was a change in strategy um, from the coal inspector with respect to the number of directives as he'd seen across his operations, the frequency of directives being given going up. And that there are prosecutions um, and even cancellation or show cause notices were increasing across the industry. As I say, there's a basket of, of regulatory tools we use, but as I reflected on that, um, I asked the question in terms of corrective action databases that minds and organisations use to close out actions from investigations, incidents, and improvement projects. You educate your people when they come on to, into the organisation as to what their responsibilities are. If they don't close them out by the due date, you start to take corrective action. If that behaviour continues, you start to show them, show cause notices, please explain why this hasn't been done. Or if it's a tick in the box and you've gone into the mine and you found they've ticked the box, but when you've gone to validate that it's been done, it hasn't. What do you do next? You move on to the punitive and probably show them the door. I pose the question, why should the regulator be any different? So lastly, moving forward, improving capacity and capability. My colleague, Herman Fashion uh, mentioned about the Central Assessment and Performance Unit. What does that mean? For the SSE, it will mean that they will talk to a centralised number. You won't be talking to your favourite inspector when you've had a, um, a high potential incident. But there will be a group of inspector -led inspectors um, who will take those calls. Why reduce the number from 50, 50 plus inspectors taking those calls to five or six inspectors, which is what we're doing? Number one, to be far more efficient in terms of those inspectors' time. Secondly, to ensure that we get consistency, accuracy, and follow up with the mine. Those field inspectors will continue to attend the mine in terms of investigating those HBIs and following up on issues. But if we're, if we're going to go forward as a data-driven regulator, it's important that we do that with accuracy and consistency. This time next year, I'll be talking with, to you about the Serious Incident Investigation Unit. Improving the evidence-based nature of, of us as a regulator. 
and we'll move from being an in, inspector-led investigator-supported investigation team to an investigator-led inspector-supported investigation squad so that we get better outcomes and better learnings in a more timely manner for the industry. And the last aspect is around benchmarking other industries in HRO, the medical profession, the aircraft, and the air traffic control to see what we as a regulator can do to improve on what we're doing. Martin Luther King had a dream. I've also got a dream where our industry will be free of serious, serious harm, where coal mine workers will be heard and not hurt, where expertise wins over authority, complex solutions win over simplicity, and where resilience is matched with a preoccupation with failure. Today, I'm not here to celebrate the achievements of the last 12 months as a regulator or as an industry. I'm here, I'm here to leave you uneasy with a strong sense of chronic unease. I'd now like to introduce Rob Dukic, our COO for RSHQ, who will talk to you about policy and legislation at, at Outlook. Thanks, Peter. Good morning, and thanks for this opportunity to talk to you about the safety and health legislative program for Queensland's resources sector. I'd like to briefly reflect on the past year or so of legislative activity as we consider a policy program and a new term of government. And in this new term of government, Resources Safety and Health Queensland, or RSHQ, will have sole responsibility for developing and delivering its legislative program. The last 12 months saw three major pieces of safety and health legislative activity relating to the resources safety and health portfolio. Firstly, the passage and commencement of the Act, which established RSHQ as the standalone regulator, a statutory entity separate from a department. Second, the extension of the offence of industrial manslaughter to employers in Queensland's resources industry. And thirdly, for the coal mining sector, laws that provide that certain statutory safety positions must be directly employed by the coal mining operator. Now, a few characteristics are common to these amendments. None was initiated at industry's request. None was the subject of broad, if any, industry support, and all had a relatively short gestation period from proposal to, commit, to commit, commitment. You may wonder why I'd go to the trouble of highlighting that, but I invite you to reflect upon the fact that while these amendments may not have been the subject of broad industry support, all of them passed unopposed in Parliament. All of them were essentially bipartisan acts. Apparently, both sides of Parliament saw a need for these actions to respond to recent events. Establishing the standalone regulator was a product of the Black Lung Inquiry following the re-identification of mine dust lung in Queensland's mining industry. In its report, the Parliamentary Select Committee conducting the inquiry pointed to widespread systemic failure as a basis for significant reform. While industrial manslaughter was an outcome, outcome of the Lions Review in relation to general work health and safety, its inclusion in resources safety legislation was expedited by a series of fatalities in the resources sector in 2018 and 19. And that same series of fatalities was also the emphasis for the coal amendments relating to statutory positions. The message here is not a difficult one, nor should it come as a surprise. In fact, it's a dependable pattern. When an issue of public importance captures the attention of community or the public or the media, especially one which carries a perception of a system that's failing or underperforming, calls for, calls for law reform, however specifically or vaguely articulated, are sure to follow. As a response to a problem, legislative action is appealing because it's visible, it's decisive and it's simple. And it's what parliaments do, they make laws. The current Board of Inquiry into Mining Incidents may result in further recommendations for amendments to the law, 
And even if its subject matter is coal mining, we've seen before that the recommendations coming out of reviews can have broader applications than just their industry of focus. All Queensland resources safety and health legislation, as we all know, is founded on the risk-based approach. It is outcomes focused. It places responsibility on industry for managing risk and preventing harm. But how you do so is largely a matter for you. Risk-based regulation is not, as some have said, self-regulation. It isn't left to industry to determine the standards it has to meet, just how it meets them. The upshot of that is where there is diminishing confidence that required standards are being met, that translates to diminishing confidence in risk-based legislation itself. And where public or parliamentary confidence in risk-based legislation falters, we should expect more prescription, which for you in industry means more restriction. At the risk of sounding facile, the best defence against increased prescription is a demonstration of effective risk-based behaviour that arrests the cycle of serious incidents, fatalities and disease. In his review of mining and quarrying fatalities in Queensland over the last 20 years, Dr Sean Brady recommended to industry that it should adopt the principles of high reliability organisational or HRO theory in order to reduce the rate of serious accidents, including fatalities. We've heard a lot about this this morning. And although the Brady Review focused on mining and quarrying, the principles of HRO theory apply to any high hazard industry. HRO theory involves five characteristics. Peter just went through them, but in particular, I'd like to focus on two. High reliability organisations are those that are preoccupied with failures rather than successes and who are reluctant to simplify. The concept of a sense of chronic unease, again, just mentioned by Peter, is relevant here. HROs are not satisfied with a simple explanation for near misses or accidents. In their investigations, they are loath to accept human error as the critical cause of an incident, recognising human error is both inevitable and the least controllable aspect of risk manage management. And Paul from the Australian Road Research Board talked about blameless investigations this morning in that regard. HROs are exhaustive in identifying hazards and seek to address them with hard rather, rather than administrative controls wherever it's possible to do so. And they are obsessed with data reporting, capturing every detail of every incidence of potential or actual harm. All of the chief inspectors have mentioned this this morning, the importance of thorough reporting and investigating. The Minister even mentioned that. You've heard that RSHQ's vision is zero serious harm. As part of our commitment to our vision, over the coming years, RSHQ wants to work with industry proactively to assist it to becoming an industry of high reliability organisations. And we propose this as a core principle of our forward legislative program. Over the coming year, RSHQ plans to develop for discussion and consultation proposals to, do, to drive HRO performance in industry, including measures to support and enhance incident not notification and reporting, hazard identification, investigation and control, and disclosure of information with high safety and health value. This will of course be complemented by proposals for compliance tools that advance and are consistent with HRO theory and measures to improve competency and awareness of hazard control. This is our proposal for a constructive and proactive program, which will support industry to enhance its safety performance and demonstrate the value of risk-based legislation. We intend that the process for developing policy for a potential bill will take place over this year and next, allowing for a full and open consultation process. Just as it's important that RSHQ as the regulator develops a proposal that is evidence-based and fulsomely consulted upon, the success of this exercise will depend on industry approaching it with a genuine objective of evolving the legislative framework into something superior to what it is now. 
experience suggests that outright resistance or rejection of proposed change stifles discussion and results in a one-sided approach to legislative development. I'll conclude by returning to Dr. Brady's review, which found that the mining and quarrying industry has a fatality cycle and can expect fatalities and serious injuries to continue without reduction if there's not significant change. Today, my colleagues have mentioned some of the things they've seen in industry over the past year that caused them concern. We've seen that reports of HBIs have dropped as we appear to be tracking to that part of the cycle where serious accidents are also going down. This is where Dr. Brady cautions us about being wary of perceiving an industry becoming safety, safer over the long term. Rather, this should prompt HROs to get out in front of the cycle before it starts to turn around, which 20 years of data suggests it inevitably will if we are complacent. Breaking this cycle requires industry to make significant changes to how it operates. With this though, there is a real opportunity in the offer of HRO theory as a model for genuine improvement and change. But if industry cannot demonstrate a willingness and ability to affect change itself, history also shows us that we should expect the matter to be taken out of industry's hands and change will be imposed upon it. We look forward to having an open discussion with industry and other stakeholders in the coming months about a proactive approach to bringing about change. That concludes today's briefing. We look forward to receiving your questions on the email address given. Um, and responses along with today's presentation will be posted on our website in the next few days. Uh, thanks for your attendance today and we look forward to meeting with you again.